I went to Warsaw for work in 2019, where I met a girl and we kicked some stuff off. After ending up in my rented apartment and going to sleep, I woke up around 2.30am to find her packing her stuff, which was on a chair in the bedroom. She walked to the door and I started asking her, where are you going? Thinking it wouldn't be a nice move to just try to walk out in the middle of the night. I couldn't see much detail since it was dark in the room, just the black silhouette of a girl. She then walked to the door, but stopped and turned toward me, it seemed, and proceeded to just stare. I started calling her name, thinking she's sleepwalking, until I heard her in my right ear. Looking over, she was still next to me in bed, slowly waking up. I looked back at the girl I saw, and she was still there. I freaked, lunged to the lamp on the bedside table, turned it on, and she was gone. I've been told about sleep paralysis, but the thing was I could sit up, move, and think clearly. Now, fast forward to the start of 2020. I was back home in Elmia, a city close to Amsterdam. Ever since I moved into my new place, I hear footsteps around the house. Once while on a video call with colleagues in my office on the first floor, right across from the staircase, I could hear someone or something bolting up the stairs, straight through my headphones. After half a year, it didn't bother me anymore until two weeks ago. When my current girlfriend was here, not the girl from Warsaw, I had the same experiences that I had in Warsaw. This time, however, I thought more clearly and grabbed my phone. I turned on the flash and aimed at the figure. When pointing at it, it was gone. I then moved the flash away and could see it again. This really boggled my mind. The figure then seemed to bow down, I believe, but proceeded to go downwards until it just disappeared into the floor. Every now and then I find chairs moved, wake up to the sound of my office chair rolling and still hear footsteps. A small town in the mountains known for being built on the idea of riches from mining has had its fair share of different personalities. Some of these souls had moved on and others had gotten lost. This town had many mining structures and oxidised mountains of minerals all abandoned. But one name sticks out to me, my friends, and a good amount of others in the town. One mine we call Sarko. This mine is a good 20 minute drive past other abandoned structures and up into the mountains. You get to a main gate that veers off into a dirt road. This takes you to an old tailings pond. A huge field elevated above the ground to hold water when there is a lot of excess water. Across the field are multiple abandoned structures that sit lonely. Right next to the inlet of the water. Me and my friend have never been out there, but we always heard of it. We ventured out to see it and also looked for paranormal experiences. As we drive in, There's a herd of deer watching our every move as we get ready to sneak our way over. We started walking down a hill that then had us jump over a river. Then a steep hill to get into the flat field that once was a tailings pond. We get to the top and right away notice that the moon is lighting up a lot of our surroundings. We could see a shadow casted of the mountain behind the buildings. So in other words, a dark side and a bright side. The walk was two football fields away from the start of the field. As we walked over, we watched the floor to watch our step. We walked what felt like 50 yards when my friend told me, hold up, we're already here. This spooked us out because it felt like we had teleported right to the base in a matter of a few steps. It was as if once we stepped into the shadow, the distance of walking was extremely tampered and felt unreal. We were looking to communicate with spirits and would hear taps on the building that would be a response to our questions. After that, we weren't experiencing too much paranormal activity, so we decided to leave. As we were walking out back to the steep and long slope, I started to hear an extra footstep behind us, almost as if we were being followed out or even escorted. I told my friend and he heard it too. In my mind, I wanted to debunk it and see if it was all imagination, so I stopped on a dot 
and made sure right behind us one extra footstep as soon as I stopped. We looked at each other in shock and I told my friend let's stay calm and just walk out normally. Once we started climbing down the steep hill, it felt as if the presence of something had just left us. And as we were leaving in the car, the same deer heard what just drive out. And a little farther down, one deer jumped in front of the car like one last go away from the spirits. I had an uneasy feeling after my parents left me in my dorm room this past September. The first few weeks were uneventful, no trouble sleeping. A detail that's important to this story is my room decorations. I brought two tiny strings of mini Himalayan salt rocks to hang in my room. One was wrapped around my rear and the other on my bookshelf. One night, I woke up at around 4am, rolled over to the side that faced my room. I noticed the Himalayan salt rock lights around my mirror glowing. The light flickered a few times before going out. I got out of bed, flipped on the lights and inspected the battery compartment. Sure enough, they were switched off. It was weird. I decided to take the batteries out and deal with it in the morning. I managed to fall asleep. Unfortunately, I had one of the scariest, most vivid dreams. In the dream, I woke up and saw the lights hanging on my bookshelf flickering. I remember getting out of bed and going to turn off the lights, but froze when I heard a voice from behind me. I don't remember exactly what was said, but it was like, oh no, not again. I woke up and was completely terrified. I raced to turn on the lights and refused to go back to sleep for the rest of the night. I kept glancing over at the mirror because I've heard mirrors can act as portals. I covered the mirror with a blanket, which made me feel a little less uneasy. It gets weirder. At about 5am, I decided to text my boyfriend. Strangely, he texted me about 15 minutes later. It was weird that he was up at this hour, especially since he was up late the night before on the phone with me. I FaceTimed him to explain exactly what happened. After my story, I asked him why he was up so early. He said he had had a scary dream and all he remembers from it is being upset and crying. He told me he had this uneasy feeling and an urge to check his phone. That's when he saw my text and texted me back. Maybe it's nothing. Maybe it was just a dream. I'm home for winter break now. I'm thankful to get a break from that room and not be afraid to fall asleep. I've always believed in aliens, despite never encountering any myself, until one night in July. These strange occurrences happened about two to three years ago in the southeast region of New Hampshire. I still can't explain what I saw and neither can my mother. My mother and I got off work and drove down this back road. We were about five to seven minutes away from our house. I'm driving. We were approaching a hill that leads up to a long narrow road through the woods. I see a bright light hovering about 20 feet above the house, perched on top of the hill. My mother notices it too. I turn off the radio and roll down the windows. No noise. I drove up the hill and noticed two cars stopped off on the side, looking up at the sky. I pass them and take a glimpse through the trees. I see a large square shaped metal object. There are circular lights shining from the bottom. My mum and I turned around in the first driveway we could find. 30 seconds, maybe less. We went back and it was gone. I was freaked out, but excited to have a UFO story of my own. The excitement gradually wore off the more frequently the sightings became. My friend and I were walking along the beach across from my family's restaurant. We saw a light hovering near the lighthouse. We assumed the light had stopped revolving since it wasn't moving. Suddenly, the light jolted forward and began flying around manically. It drove behind the houses along the beach and disappeared. At this point, I've had another person in my life experience separate events. I know it wasn't just a figment of my mom's imagination. My mother and I saw it about once a week for the next month after that. 
the light would be hovering in the distance, completely silent, and would disappear once we were too close. We chose to ignore it. As long as the light kept its distance, we felt moderately safe. Then came the close encounter. My mum and I got off work around 8 and returned home with a trunk of groceries. Our condo is at the very end of a cul-de-sac. And at the other end, a tiny hill with a line of tall trees. As we're bringing bags into the house, I notice a light off in the distance. The light starts getting closer and closer until it's above the tree line, which is about 100 feet, give or take, from where our car is and stops. My mum is frightened at this point. I tell her I'm done being afraid and stand there, waiting for the light to approach me. As I begin walking towards it, it zooms off to my left and disappears above the forest tree line. I was shaken. The light had stopped and seemed to be observing my mother and I until we took notice. Since that summer, we've never seen it again except for one other time, but we chalked it up to a drone. We've tried to explain it. Helicopters, but there was no noise. Planes, stopped moving randomly. Even drones, still didn't explain the uneasy silence, etc. We began to think it was trying to abduct us, or maybe it already had, and we had no memory of it. So I'd like to share something that happened to me when I was about 9 or 10 years old. I'm 26 now. So to set the context, I was back in England living with my family, in an old Victorian house with my sisters and mum. Just us girls. I loved the house. I never felt spooked or whatever in it. One night, I was in bed ready to sleep. And all of a sudden, my bed cover went perfectly neat and flat. Like no bumps, creases or whatsoever. And then loads of symbols started to appear fast. I can vaguely recall what they were. It's really hard to explain. When I try to rethink it, I get all uncomfortable and kind of feel sick if I concentrate on what I saw too much. So then it all stopped suddenly and I felt a weight at my feet as if someone was sitting down on my bed with me. So I was petrified and not moving, as if I was stuck, not able to shout. I then found myself surrounded by a bright light and I had all these people leaning over me. The way I explain it is, you know when you're getting ready for an operation and that you are in the operating room and that everyone is waiting for you to fall asleep to start the actual operation? They're all there, looking down at you. Exactly that. Well, this was too much for me. And I leapt from my bed and jumped down the stairs, four by four. Ran from the house screaming, they're going to hurt me. My mum grabbed me before I got on the road and I can't remember what happened after that. I was talking about this with her yesterday and she actually told me that this went on for two or three nights before stopping. My house has had portal problems for as long as I can remember. We don't have a haunting per se since we believe it's a vortex of some sort of spirits and entities to cross through so they come and go but most stay a while before leaving, if they ever do. There's a cemetery up the street that I frequent often, and we speculate a possible connection between the two. I decided to compile a select few stories from over the years, in case it may interest someone, because it sure as hell interests me. My chest was getting very tight just typing this out. I'm aware I overexplained things, but I think I'd rather provide more information than needed than less. Background. My siblings, 27 male and 24 female, and I, 18 female, were raised in the same house since birth. My brother has since moved out twice, while my sister and I remain at home with our parents. We're all pretty intuitive and sensitive when it comes to energies, particularly my sister and I. Ever since we were all young, we individually decided that there is some sort of portal in our basement, which is now referred to exclusively as the hole. The hole resides in an unfurnished part of the basement, which was used for storage for the first 22-ish years of my parents owning it. It's an odd indent built into the wall that goes from floor to ceiling floorboard, just wide enough for a person to stand in 
behind where the wall would be if it were built straight. It's in the far corner of the room, the only one not visible from the door. When it was in storage, the room connected at the opposite corner from the hole to our laundry room, like the corners of the room overlapped and formed a high doorway between them. Whenever I was young for as far back as I can remember, I was petrified to go into the room whenever my mom asked me to get her something, or even to go into the laundry room without quickly switching on the lights in the storage before running from the door as fast as possible, which was still extremely nerve-wracking for little me. On the occasions I didn't turn on the light, I could feel something watching me intently from the opposite corner. Twice I saw what I think were glowing eyes in the dark. Around the same time as the aforementioned was occurring, I was having repetitive nightmares for years, until I was probably 9 or 10 I believe. It was the exact same up to a point. I was being hunted by a man with a half a face through an abandoned hospital. The only difference every night was that when he'd inevitably catch me, he would torture me to death in a new way, seemingly more sadistically each time than the last. I'd wake up just as I began to feel what I'm pretty sure was my life fading away. It felt so real, so painful. I'd wake up with marks occasionally that correspond to what had happened in the nightmare the night before. Take note, this was when I was five and possibly younger, to tenish, and my mother was careful to shelter me from violent media or concepts when I was young, so these ideas should not have been imaginable for me at the time. When I finally worked up the courage to tell my mum about my nightmares, she prayed over me and blessed me with holy water. Catholic moms, man. And within a week, her continuing to pray for it to stop, they suddenly disappeared. And I noticed the entity that was making me so petrified of downstairs was either gone or not showing itself. We came to the conclusion later that whatever it was had attached itself to me and was feeding off my fear of it through influencing my dreams. She thinks it was a demon, but I'm not sure of that. Small things happened over the years, but from the time I was around 10 to 13, it was nothing remarkable. When I was 13, my brother and his girlfriend moved in after she got pregnant in order to be able to provide the best for their child. We converted the storage room into an apartment for them. He finished off a small square of the laundry room to be my niece's room for the time so the two rooms are no longer openly connected. We had barely ever entered the room in years, but it still had a very heavy feeling after so much time. While moving stuff around, activity like things going missing and popping back up, and electronics turning off and on, began to start up. Whoever was there at the time, they didn't like being disturbed very much. After my brother and near sister-in-law got settled in, it died back down, partially because they felt the hole was too ominous and covered it with particle board that remains there to this day, but stayed active enough to let us know something was still there. It would turn on flashlights that had debt batteries in them for the year before or require a hard push on, a button, and turn them off when you go to grab them. Set off my niece's electronic toys in the middle of the night, knock on walls, whisper, etc., we just learned to get used to it after a while of being in the room often. This past summer, my brother's family moved into their own place and I moved into the apartment to escape my traumatic old room upstairs, which is a whole different issue itself. Of course, as they began packing stuff up, the activity got more noticeable again, as well as when I was moving my stuff in. I've been here since about July and I think I've experienced more activity in the room in the past four to five months than all of it in my life before combined. I began not only hearing them and seeing their influence on electronics more and more, but sometimes seeing figures and seeing them interact with non-electronic objects, like opening and closing the doors in the basement when nobody's looking. In the beginning, the first I saw was when I rolled over at night and glanced toward the foot of the bed, towards the hole, where I saw the silhouette of someone's shoulders up for a split second. It didn't make me feel scared, just unsettled me for a moment, as anyone would if they saw someone in their room at night. The entities listen when you talk about them in the house. We can tell. So I talked to my sister about it the next day, 
and said something along the lines of, it's kind of rude of me not to have my couch in the room yet. He could have sat on the corner of the bed if he wanted. Well, the next night, I came back from the bathroom and opened my door to the dim light of my wax melter. And I swear up and down that I saw the dark figure sitting on the corner of my bed before flipping on the light after a split second. Obviously, there was no figure when the light turned on, but there was an impression of a butt on my bed sheets, as if someone had just been there. This confirmed they definitely listened to what we say in the house at least, but seemed to be more responsive when not being talked to directly. So it's easiest to just talk about it with my sister, to influence their behavior. Every once in a while, I'll feel a new presence appear. One of the most noteworthy newcomers was a real dick to start. In the beginning of it, I'd feel a massive feeling of dread that someone was standing right behind the door to my room, about six feet tall. After a few times of just standing, he'd switch to walking down the stairs that are right by my room, but only the bottom six stairs, and then proceeded to stand at my door for minutes. This mostly happened at night, and when I told my family about it, my mom took me out of the house to tell me she heard it too, and I'm not crazy. She thought it was me going downstairs, but she waited to hear my door open and close, but she never did, because who she heard wasn't me. I think the worst time he got me was the last time he tried to mess with me. It was just about noon. I was watching TV in my room while home alone, when I heard the sound of someone walking down the bottom half of the stairs. He stood at my door for a minute without making a sound before starting to slowly jiggle my door handle. I thought I was going to have a panic attack because the only exit had an unknown entity on the other side of the door. And I sat frozen for at least 15 minutes just watching my handle jiggle until it stopped when my dad came home. For some reason, the fact that it was the middle of the day made it feel even more threatening. I got really fed up at this point and started ranting loudly to my sister how he's all talk and isn't going to do shit. How he just wants to intimidate me and needs to learn his place in this household. I honestly expected a little backlash, but he only walked down the stairs one more time that night before stopping and it hasn't happened since. Most recently, a couple weeks ago, my mom decided to try to pry away the portal for no reason. They caused no harm or annoyance in a long time and I honestly enjoy their company. I've never wanted to banish any entities or their means of transportation if they haven't done anything harmful. Since she made that prayer, they've been very upset with my mom and more shy around me compared to before. The day or two after she prayed, I was near the top of the stairs making pizza rolls when my mom went downstairs to do laundry, singing on the way. She was halfway down the stairs, my bedroom door that I had left open, slammed, closed. The door swings open rather than closed, and it was done with force. They wanted to make sure she knows they're upset with her. The next thing, she was taking a bath when the towel hanging behind her head fell in the water. She said in all the years of living here, that hasn't happened to her, but didn't think much of it until she went to reach for the towel on the floor and saw the hand towel across the room be pulled to the floor. To say the least, she wasn't pleased with being bothered during bath time. Since she decided to make this prayer, I've noticed they will not be active while I'm in the room anymore. But practically, as soon as I step foot out of it, there's tons of movement and sounds starting up. I'll come back and my door will be open when I leave it closed or vice versa. And sometimes, things will even be moved slightly before I return to the room. I'm not sure why they're feeling the need to be so much more active when there aren't direct witnesses at the moment. And don't get the feeling they're mad at me. They're just upset that someone tried to close their portal that's probably significant to them. I tried my best to coexist with them peacefully and be kind and kind of feels like she ruined the bond. Which I know sounds insane, but it's a weird situation I'm in and I've learned to accept. I care for them and their well-being, regardless of if they're a physical person or not. And she offended my guests. So about 10 years ago in 2011, I moved out of my family's house into my first apartment. This is in a small town of Colorado, 
with its only real claim to fame being a big hole in the ground. I moved in with a buddy of mine who I knew in high school and all was well for a while. My friend needed to move out of state, leaving me to a cycle of replacements to cover his part of bills. The last roommate I had, I had almost no contact with, but he managed the money and mostly kept it in his room at the back of our place. Eventually, one day I get a knock on the door. Police with a warrant step inside to his room, cuff him and leave. I still don't know what it was about, but I haven't heard from him since. The police interaction was the last straw for my landlord and received a three-day court mandated eviction. While cleaning his room, I removed mostly trash, a toolbox that was mainly screwdrivers, and what seems like a sketchbook or journal that he might have bound himself. Until recently, when I found it at the top of a closet, I was expanding. I had completely forgotten about it. I have no idea how it made it through the cleaning and subsequent moves over the last decade. I can think of at least three places I lived, not to mention couch hopping, yet somehow this book made it through. I'm not sure where to start researching this thing, but the pen work is so detailed and painstaking. I felt it must be something of note. The book itself is mainly blank, but has some writing, English, backward, other stuff that looks hieroglyphic. Whatever help will be appreciated. This story happened to me about 12 years ago. I was around 24 at the time. I worked hospitality, so it'd be later at night when my friends and I hung out. So, at around 9 o'clock, my friend and I decided to go for a drive, someplace we've never been. Just get in the car and go. I offered and wanted to drive because my mother was out of town and I was using her Mercedes. It was one of those early 90s e-bodies, the ones that were big piles of heavy steel, a real tank of a car. I only mention the car body because it becomes relevant later in the story. He happily agreed and we hit the road. We lived near, near Milwaukee, Wisconsin at the time. Good old Wisconsin where well, you get a lot of really good stories out of, I've noticed. Seems to be a pretty paranormal state. Either way, we drive north out of the city and drive for about an hour, when I see an exit I don't recognise and decided to get off there. There was nothing at this exit other than cornfields, no gas station or restaurant signs, no visible light of a town in any direction. So we were in a place we don't recognise, but that was the point just driving to get nowhere because the speed limit was 35 and we were in no rush. The moon was out enough that everything was pretty visible. About a mile into the cornfields, we could see two kids on the right side of the road. We comment on how weird it is because there's no housing or stores or even lights on the horizon. Plus, it was 10.30ish at night. Naturally, there were two larger guys, so we didn't worry about anything so I slowed down so we could inquire if their car broke down or if they were okay. As we pulled up, I noticed the kid in front clothing. It was a stained cream colored tweed type shirt with real tattered sleeves and overalls with only one strap. He appeared to be maybe 12 years old. The second kid was taller, wearing a red flannel type shirt with old times looking khaki pants. However, I could barely notice the court taller kid standing further behind the smaller one, because as I pulled up noticing the clothes, I got to see the whole child fully, and his arms were to the side, slightly raised, almost in that iconic zombie way. But his eyes, I couldn't take my eyes off of him, and I did my best to mutter to my friend, you're seeing this too, right? His eyes were pitch black, blacker than the night, but easy to see as he stood there staring at us. I didn't know what the heck I was seeing, but I've never been so frightened in my life, and I've had several odd experiences that have left me unable to deny that there is more in this world than what we understand. So we stopped for a moment, locking eyes with whatever this thing was. It was no child. It was evil. I have zero doubts about that. We quickly agreed to go, and fast. We're not going to inquire with them. This was straight out of the twilight zone. And I remembered the hitchhiker, and that was not happening tonight, no sir. 
So we go and we clamour between ourselves. What the? Did we just see? What was that? What the hell was that? Still no signs of homes. Just open cornfields. How these two kids be, could be there, I don't know. But I believe those were not kids. So I keep driving. And we get out of the fields onto a wooded, windy road. Shortly after probably around five minutes. Here in Wisconsin, there are random historical markers displaying information in whatever year has happened. I only mention that because I passed on the curve, so I glanced at that. As I'm driving through a curve going about 45 miles an hour, a creature walks in front of my car, my mum's car. As I saw it, it was nothing like I had ever seen. Its spine was tall, it stuck above the hood ornament as I hit it. It was a grey colour and looked like nothing I've ever seen. It had a very tall arch in its spine, almost like when a cat hisses and goes on its toes. That kind of shape, but in a very tall, gangly creature. I hit this thing straight on with the tank of a Benz. My friend is freaked out at this point, as am I to say the least. I stopped immediately, but now we're both a bit scared of the children of the corn. And now, this thing is literally within minutes of one another. We decide getting out is not going to happen. But I decide to stay in the locked car, but use the car in its lights to see what we hit and make sure whatever the hell it was is dead and I needed to know what I just saw. I drive in tiny circles backing up and forwards looking for this creature, but after checking every inch within a hundred yards and not seeing anything, including not a drop of blood where I hit it, straight on with a bends, making contact with its spine, body and head anywhere. This was unnerving, and although I wanted to check my mother's car, that would be dealt with further down the road. We were not going to get out there, so we decided to head home at this point. Fifteen minutes later, I got back to the freeway, and I needed to get out and see how bad the car was. As I got out to check, quickly, as I was not taking any chances tonight, I noticed my grill was busted in, but nothing too bad. So I made sure it was secure, and got back in as quickly as possible. My friend decided to stay inside the car. Recently, I heard of the black-eyed kids and freaked out a little bit. I didn't know what they were a real thing. I thought I just saw a couple demon kids or damned ghosts or I didn't know what to think. To this day, I've looked through tons of photos of supposed cryptid beasts and mythological creatures looking for what I hit. And the closest I've found is some Algonquin drawings of Wendigos. And they were very close to what I believe I saw and hit that night. It seems to me very odd. Both things could happen so close to one another to not be related. Possibly it was an evil area or possibly a ley line. I don't know. I would like to point out I've lived in Wisconsin a long time. And it was not a deer or a coyote or anything else. What I hit was nothing native to the known Wisconsin landscape. And neither were those horrid kids. I'll never forget either of those faces and just hope I never come across them ever again. So my friend and I were driving around, just going wherever. Earlier in the car, she mentioned that it would be fun to watch a movie at a graveyard sometime. Now, hours had passed and the sun had set. She didn't have to be home for a bit, so I asked if we should check out a graveyard nearby. The graveyard was closed, but you could get your car up a little hill and walk around the gate. So we're checking this place out and it's relatively small. No mausoleums or anything, just graves. I started to read the names on the graves to maybe pay my respects a bit. And I find this group of graves, all with the same last name, so probably a family. These guys were born in the 1800s, so I was excited. And then, I found a guy with the same birthday as me. His death date was in February, but I don't remember the day. I wish I did. So fast forward, we get cold and decide to head back home. We get in the car, and my steering wheel is so hard to move. I assume it was because we were in a grassy and muddy area, and I started to slowly back down the hill. The graveyard was directly off a busy road, speed limit around 45, but it was late and there weren't many cars out, so I assumed I'd be able to back out and head on my way. Spoilers. Nope. 
I get down the hill and I'm trying to turn and go forward, but I'm realizing that the gas isn't working and I'm in the middle of a lane. I push on my brakes, which are really hard to push on, and stop my car. I'm turning the key and there's no sound. I'm starting to freak the fuck out now. The road is two lanes, so people are passing me and I have my hazards on, but I don't know what's going on. P.S. I'm a newer driver and I don't know squat about cars. Eventually, some guys come around and ask if everything's okay, to which I reply, no, do you guys know about cars? They did and told me the battery was dead. Looking back, if my battery was dead, the car would sputter, but I was panicking and it sounded plausible. So they helped me get my car out of the lane and off the side of the road. I called my dad at this point and he tells me to take the key out, let everything turn off and start the car again. I do so and it works like a charm. So I drove home and immediately took my dog and went upstairs. He, my dog, is freaking out for some reason. I hop into bed and he jumps up with me, but the hair on his back is sticking up. He then proceeded to get up and lay down a bunch, tail between his legs. I calmed him down. I've been informed that my car was not working because I forgot to turn on the engine, but I've never only turned on the battery before. And I distinctly remember turning the key while on the road. Maybe it's all a coincidence. I'm kind of hoping it is, but I'm still a little spooked. When I was between 8 to 12 years old, I grew up in a very haunted house. I believe that there were many spirits there and I got a glimpse of one who I always believed to be demonic. The best way I could describe its appearance was that it looked like the mummy from the movie The Mummy, but it had huge white eyeballs with small pupils. I started experimenting with using crystals. I would wear them around my neck for protection. I wore rose quartz, amethyst and black onyx. Not at the same time, but separately. I was very careful about where I purchased them and I made sure to cleanse them. I never wore them to bed, but the one time I did, I regretted it. I fell asleep wearing my black onyx. Around 3 a.m. I'm jolted awake because I had a bad dream. I looked at the side of my bed and I saw the same demon looking creature standing beside me, hovering over me, smiling with a face that looked pure evil. I started freaking out and screaming and it woke my boyfriend up. When my boyfriend woke up, it was gone. I got out of bed and shut off the light. A few weeks later, I saw a shadow person pacing back and forth at the foot of my bed. Then I saw and heard a shadow person walking down the stairs after I caught them staring at me. My amethyst crystal completely disappeared without a trace, but I got rid of my black onyx and haven't experienced any activity since. I still have my rose quartz and I've had no problems with it. I would also like to mention that when I was younger, when I saw this thing for the first time, I lived in Southern Pennsylvania. Now I live in Western New York. So I think that thing may have followed me, but I don't know why I'm seeing it again for the first time over 10 years later. The unit I'm currently working on seems to have the most activity from my own personal experience. I've worked on all of the units, but on this one, I've seen the most. Almost every single day, I see shadow people. I catch glimpses out of the corner of my eye, or I just see a shadowy figure straight on. I work evening and night shifts. Strangely, I've experienced more on the evening shift. The unit I work on is also the COVID unit, so that might partly why it's more active. The COVID wing consists of two very long halls that meet together at a double door that leads to a kitchen area where there is also another residential room. Kind of weird setup, but hey, it works. My coworker was behind the double doors one night, taking care of one of the sick residents. But she had gone out of the kitchen area to take off her PPE. She saw and heard two children running around playing, but it was late at night and we weren't allowed to have inside visits. Turns out, Everybody at work says if someone sees the two children, then that means someone is going to die. And it's true. We have a chapel in the nursing home for the residents, but it's behind two sets of double doors 
and the residents can't get in there on their own due to codes and locks. There is a set of stairs behind the first set of doors, and everybody has repeatedly seen a bald guy sitting in the chapel late at night through the window of the hall, looking into the chapel. We had a resident who used to be a child molester. One night, he woke up in hysterics and crying, absolutely unconsolable. He said there were children surrounding him, standing by his bed and laughing at him. He died the next day. I went into a resident's room late one night during rounds at around 3 a.m. I was working on the dementia slash wonder risk unit. I'm standing next to the resident's bed and she asks, who's that man standing behind the curtain? I didn't think much of it because she did usually hallucinate, but within an hour, two residents from different units passed away. And the resident I was with, roommate fell out of bed and got hurt really bad. Liked turning off by themselves consistently late at night when everyone was in bed. What are your scary haunted nursing home stories? About a week and a half ago, me, my manager and another colleague of mine were driving around at 1am to try and find somewhere where we could get some food at a drive through Every 24 hour McDonald's appeared to be closed, so we ended up driving 30 minutes away to try and find somewhere that was open. Eventually, we gave up and pulled up at a service station around 2am. It was here really quiet, and we weren't even sure if it was open due to COVID, but we got out to check anyway. We walked into the doors, and it was mostly shut apart from toilets in a small shop, with one lonely worker sat behind a till. All the fast food places were shut, lights off. We used the toilet, and my manager recalled that she'd actually been here before. And there was another part of the service station across a bridge that could be open. So we went off to search for it. We found the walkway connecting to the bridge up two flights of stairs. The bridge was covered with windows surrounding the outside, showing a view of the motorway beneath. My manager said that the bridge was giving her the creeps, and I had to agree. It was long and narrow and dimly lit, with nobody else around. We decided to run as fast as we could to the other side. Honestly, it was unsettling. We made our way down the stairs at the end and were met with dead silence. Once again, we were faced with closed restaurants and dim lighting. There wasn't a single other person around and we were walking aimlessly around a large unoccupied space. A feeling of unease settled in. We couldn't take much more of the creepiness so we ran back up the stairs. Back across the bridge as fast as we could possibly manage. We caught our breath once we were back to the other side and commented on how strange the area had been. After that, we got snacks from the single open shop and walked back to the car to have a smoke. But the odd chilling feeling remained with us. We all agreed that we felt as though a lot of time had passed, despite the whole thing taking around 20 minutes only. The car park was empty and the air felt off, like the pressure had shifted. That's the best way I can describe it. We went home after that and tried to sleep it off, but when we woke up, things still weren't the same. Since then, the world has felt off to all of us. Colours look different, nothing feels normal or right. Things are the same and yet completely different. It's hard to describe. Life just feels more like a dream, and we all have a sense of being there in our day-to-day life, but not being present. We struggle to connect our minds to our physical bodies and be present in the moment. It sounds crazy, but it's been a very real experience for all three of us. We all agreed that this started when we left the service station that night. Then, a really weird thing happened tonight. So far, Google has nothing for me. Anyway, tonight we were dealing with some pretty morbid stuff with a friend of ours that's suffering with her mental health badly. We left her with the police and my manager and my colleague and I set off driving home. We discussed that night at the service station again. Noting that all the bad things that were happening with our friend and her mental health started after that. Other unpleasant events had followed as well, and we pondered the significance of our creepy adventure and the bad things that were happening now. I said, it's like since that night, nothing has been the same. And then the weird thing happened. We both started crying simultaneously, 
as if someone had turned a tap on for both of us. Water started leaking out of our eyes at exactly the same time, and we were so freaked. I felt a wave of sadness and emotion, but it wasn't enough to make me cry, and my colleague never cries. Ever. We're sure now more than ever that something happened that night. We just don't know what. We've joked about ending up in another dimension, and I don't normally believe anything like that. But this has me questioning because I'm honestly convinced that something isn't right. That we've encountered something that's changed all three of us. We just don't know what. Even as I write this, I feel off and a tad fearful. I have no idea why. I've been thinking of putting this here for a while, but I've been delaying organizing all the events on paper. There's a lot. I keep remembering more and more every time I pass over this with a pen. So I'm sorry if it's grown into a huge post by the time it sees the light of day, so to speak. Basically, throughout my life, there's been a figure, or a few, following me from house to house, sleepover to sleepover, even appearing at work and school sometimes. I know what you're thinking. I promise I'm not crazy. It would be impossible for other people to react to these events too, if they were all in my head. And though I try to be as investigative and rational as I can whenever something strange happens around me, check the windows, doors, box, check for intruders, etc. There is still a huge number of instances that I have no answers for, nor does my family. The earliest memories I have of the ghosts was a child. When my mother remarried, we moved in with him and his two children, younger than me, both of whom have experienced things too. It was a small two bed slash one bath. Outside of the room where my step siblings and I slept was a small corridor which basically was only big enough so that when you entered it, leaving the kitchen, the bathroom was on the left and the bedroom was on the right. That's it. And that's the spot I first remember seeing a man who would stand just outside the bedroom door every night. He was at least six feet tall, boots on with filthy pants that wrinkled loosely about his legs. I never saw what he was wearing up top, but I did get the impression he had great big eyes. I was too afraid to look at him directly. I still don't like to think about that face. We'd have the door cracked a bit for the kitchen light to come in at night, and he'd suddenly appear and block out that light. He'd just stand there, looking at us through the door. We'd call out to our parents, but there was never anything there to show them by the time they arrived from the master bedroom on the other side of the house. This and the typical shadow people stuff like leaning into doorways as well as items disappearing carried on for the next few years that we lived there. Whenever my cousins would come over for a sleepover, they would become nervous upon entering the house, as if they knew something was wrong. They started showing me pictures on their new camera phones, remember when we called them that, of orbs. I told them it was dust. They'd sometimes ask me if anyone else was home because they could hear voices coming from the next room. By then, I knew we had something paranormal going on, for certain, but I didn't believe them at first because how could they have experienced something new before me at my own house? Well, soon after, I started hearing my mother call me into the rooms that turned out to be empty. Voices, check. I started to think I was losing my mind at just seven years old. We were also starting to spot people walking around in rooms if the door was slightly cracked. People, as in new figures, not just the man from the doorway. People walking in circles, aimlessly or waving their arms around. Why are ghosts always doing the strangest things? I once saw a woman with blonde hair in a red dress with large white polka dots leap into my parents' bedroom from the living room where I was watching TV. She didn't approach the door. I didn't see her beforehand. She just appeared mid-stride and just sailed into the next room and disappeared. I just saw the tail end of her dress and could make out the blonde hair from my peripheral vision. She made no sound. My whole family is Hispanic, with no light-haired people in our circles at the time, and there's no way our parents had anyone over in that tiny house without everyone in there knowing. About 2003, I was by then nine. We were getting to, ready to move into a bigger house, which better suited the needs of our family. 
I was looking forward to literally geographically getting away from that house. The ghosts, the dread of nightfall, seemed like a nice prospect. Until my first day alone in the house. My parents were very trusting of us kids and left us at home during breaks between school. We were watching TV. Then my stepbrother and sister and I started hearing a clapping sound. It was coming from one of the back rooms. Scared, we went to look there, but there was nobody there. Clapping? Yes, one person clapped loudly as if to congratulate the performance. But there was nobody back there, and it was my stepsister's room it was coming from. The door was closed. No, we didn't open it until our parents came home. It should also be noted that my stepdad's brother moved into the small house shortly after we moved into the new house, and no paranormal activity has been reported there since. Happenings still happened regularly at the new house, however. Sightings through doorways, full conversations in empty rooms, electronics turning on and off on their own, typical ghost stuff. And as we grew up, we just kind of learned to shrug it off. It became a thing for any one of us to suddenly declare that they've just seen something, because honestly, it happened that often. Side note, we had a dog war at this new house named Nemo, who shortly passed away under unknown circumstances. He just died out of nowhere. We buried him in the backyard and put a cross there, but removed it shortly after, after the new dog started peeing on it. Okay, back to the story. The night we got that second dog, Charlie, I put him in his little kennel, which is situated at the foot of my bed, latched the door shut and climbed into bed. Shortly after, I heard Charlie's collar jingling as I assumed he was awake and he started to whimper. Not thinking, I patted on the bed next to me like I used to for Nemo. And shortly after, I heard claws rough scratch the carpet. You know, like when a dog kicks off the ground when it jumps and then the bed slouches where he landed. I felt small paw prints circle around and a little body plop down on the bed by my feet. It was then that my heart started to flurry as I remembered I had closed and locked Charlie's kennel. There wasn't supposed to be a dog on my bed. I hopped out of bed and turned on the lights and lo and behold, Charlie is still in his kennel and there's nothing on my bed. I didn't sleep that night. Needless to say, that little guy and I became best friends after I'd hold on to him on nights I was really scared. Not that anyone's asking. But as of writing, he's 16 and still running around. Old for a miniature schnauzer. Probably not related to the ghost stuff, but it's abnormal enough for a dog of this type, so I thought it was worth pointing out. Around this time, circa 2009, something new had started to occur. I call it the glaring, because that's what it felt like. It didn't feel like I was being watched. It felt like I was being stared at heavily. Picture walking into a busy room and everyone stops what they're doing and they just glare at you. No talking, no break in eye contact, glaring. Now imagine that room is always the darkest and coldest one, despite having the largest windows. It felt thick. The glaring happened in several rooms. Sporadically but it almost always presided over the front living room, which is why our family had taken to the back den space more warmly instead. I've grown up and have since moved out and as far as I know, they still don't use that front room much. It was also at this time that I started feeling the bottoms of my shirts getting pulled on, as if a child was trying to get my attention. I also remember an instance where the glass sconce over the hallway light was thrown across the hall. I had just walked past it to go to the bathroom and was closing the door when I heard a humongous crash. I opened the door and saw pieces of glass spinning across the floor. My mom asked, what was that? And I just told her to come look. That sconce was attached to the wall in such a way that it had to have been lifted out of the metal setting, which was screwed to the wall, and then pushed out from the wall in order to become loose enough to even come close to maybe falling down. Or else it would just fall back into its metal setting. I know I hadn't closed the door yet, so it couldn't have been vibrations from the closing door. We still don't have answers, and I've returned to that sconce fixture time and time again, 
trying to figure out how it came off its rest. The bulb is still bare to this day. I never replaced it. Ugh. Now, I mentioned before that we had been seeing figures leaning into doorways or rooms peeking at us. But one time particularly jarred me. It was a night when my step-siblings were with their other family and my parents had stepped across the street to pick at a neighbor's yard sale. So I was alone. I was studying on my bed without my glasses on. I'm nearsighted. And I started detecting one of those figures from my peripherals. It gets real quiet around me, like the air got sucked out of the room or something. I look up and with my fuzzy vision, I see that familiar shape pull its head back and hide on the other side of my door to the hallway. Oh, hey ghosty, I say, and I return to studying. Then it comes back again, and this time when I look up, it doesn't pull back away immediately. It hesitates for just a second, and before it quickly vanishes behind the door, I saw its face. No details because I wasn't wearing my glasses, except for the most prominent feature. Great big eyes. I freaked the fuck out and called my parents to come home because of the ghosts and they came home right away. At the time, I must have been 15. Almost every night this entire time, I'd awaken in the night to look out into the hallway and would see that man just standing there in the dark. Other times, I could hear footsteps in the dark entering the hallway at the kitchen and heading up to the doorway of my bedroom and then stop and start walking in place. Pat, 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 pat. Shoes tapping the tile floor just behind the slightly cracked door. I could see the shadow figure out there going up and down with every step, always looking directly in my direction, as if they knew I was watching them too. God freaks me out just remembering it. I remember thinking how illogical it was. Seeing things that weren't there must make me crazy, right? I moved away from there when I was 19 and moved in with my partner, whom I would later marry. We've been in several apartments and have rented homes. Every single place we go, there are those figures. There are the voices. There are the things going missing. My partner and I once found small child-sized handprints on the sliding glass door of our third story apartment. We have no kids and no kids visit us and we definitely cleaned it since we'd moved in. We've also seen a man sitting on our bed tying his boots from the corner of our eye on several occasions. When I was 25, I think, I reconnected with my, with my biological father, and he told me stories he remembered from when I was small. It was just him, my partner, and me having some breakfast at Denny's or IHOP or something. It had been since I was three or four years old since I had seen him. He was telling me about times I would wake up at night, and he'd pull out some crackers and cheese for me to eat as a midnight snack without my mom knowing. I digress. He continued into some weird things that happened when I was little. He said that on several nights, he would come into my room to check on me sleeping, and he'd hear me talking as he approached. As he got closer, he said he almost thought he heard a voice say something back to me. That's when he charged into the room and asked who I was talking to. He said that I didn't know, and he, out loud, told whatever was there to leave me alone and to leave us in peace. I guess it did, until he was out of the picture, and the new stepdad took his place. That story sent shivers up my spine, not because I remember it, because I don't, but in the back of my mind I always knew there had always been something watching me. Ever since the corona lockdowns have been a thing, and now that we're spending more time at home, we're noticing less and less activity going on. While it's been an extremely unsettling journey with these entities, none of us have ever felt at risk of harm and so have never sought help to rid ourselves on them. It's just now surprising, that's all. It's been so many years. We still hear talking and movements in other rooms. The sounds of fabric, like someone's clothes as they moved about the room, can be heard midday. It's all just nuts. When I was young, I got married to a guy that I would call Jack for the story's stake. Jack's mom is involved in the story, and I'll call her Mary. Jack and I got married young, and divorce ensued a few years later. He had developed some issues that I was not equipped to deal with, including constantly threatening suicide if I didn't give in to his demands. The marriage was emotionally taxing and toxic. 
That being said, we loved each other very much. When I left her for the first time, he did as expected and prescribed emotional blackmail. Jack said, as I'm sure has been said to others, I will not live without you. In a weird way, I believed him, but I was not sure how it would all play out. Besides, that wouldn't happen to me. Not really. Fast forward to 10 years post-divorce to this man. I hear he goes downhill. It's heartbreaking. I'm devastated. I tried to reach out. For all the issues, there was a tremendous amount of love. However, I had to move on. 10 years later, I'm remarried, have kids, and a happy little suburban family. On my seven year wedding anniversary to my then current husband, he divorced me. Yes, this death was a factor. I got the phone call that would change my entire world. Jack had chosen my anniversary to slit his own throat. I could hardly process it, so I fell apart. So we had just moved cross country and I drove red eye back to my hometown to see Jack's mom, Mary, on Christmas day. See his room, his home, his things. Say goodbye to him and maybe try and get some closure. Mary had let very few people in to do what I was doing, so I was very honoured and grateful. I got the courage to ask for a memento as I had nothing left to remember him by. I knew that I needed something. She let me stay in his room for a while, talk to him and look around. I wasn't sure what I was going to take, but I knew when I saw it that it would speak to me. Jack among other things, was very OCD, literal diagnosis, and his clothing was kept impeccable. It appeared he had just done laundry and there was a stack of precision folded clothing on a chair. I decided I might like a hoodie, preferably one I could remember him wearing. I knew the things on the chair were probably new items, but I looked through them anyway. Mary talked with me the whole time, looking at each item with me. As I suspected, I found nothing on the chair. Then I looked through his closet and trunk, thinking I might find older items. Nothing. Mary and I continued, I was just happy to be there and say goodbye. See his things, his life. I told Mary thank you. I told Jack that I loved him for probably the 12,000th time. I was thinking of leaving. I, of course, had been crying and turned one last time to look at his room. I could smell him, I could hear him, and I just needed one last look. I knew I would never be in there again. When I turned around, on top of the stack on the chair was a hoodie I had bought for him when we were kids. I'd know it anywhere. He wore it constantly. He loved it. I know for certain, and Mary was with me. That hoodie was not on that chair, and I had not seen it in any of his clothing. I felt this gush of love and warmth, and I knew without a doubt that Jack was there in that room, and I'd gotten a Christmas gift. I still have a hard time wrapping my mind around it, even all these years later. So back when I was like 16, a friend and I used to mess around with a Ouija board. We were both practicing Wicca, even though we didn't know what the fuck we were doing at all. And we found things like this fun. So she'd come over one night, and when she'd gone to the bathroom, and of course, naive young May was still a little bit suspicious of the authenticity of our session and thought our friend was just moving the planchet. So she decided to play on her own and when it pulled harder than she'd ever felt and started to spell, she obviously said goodbye and freaked out. Fast forward a while, I had started having sleep paralysis and semi-awake hallucinations of this guy in my room. Now at first, it was kind of how most people describe a shadow person. Just kind of a shape with no detail. But after a while, it began to look more and more like a person. I had done a lot of research into it and could never really find out what it was. Because it never really did much, but I knew it was there and real. And one night, after a particularly bad fight with my family, I went to sleep crying. Immediately, when I fell asleep, I got the paralysis and felt something like holding me from behind. I freaked out and woke myself up and cried some more. It was so weird to me. Now for a long time, I thought I'd made this shit up in my head due to trauma from my abusive family. That was until my f over Christmas, 
when I was with my mother's, with the sibling that now stayed in the room that I'd stayed in, and began to ask questions about a shadow person or demon that had been causing him some problems. Now this brother is not a liar. He also really doesn't believe in paranormal things, so when he came to me claiming that something resides in the room, that throws things at him, scratches him in his sleep, had knocked over his fish tank, throws the closet doors off the rails, the little track thingies on the frame, and just causing chaos, I was quick to think back about my experience with the shadow man. Also to him, it looked like a shadow, not the man I'd seen. It was very tall and had long fingers, no detail again. Also, when I say it looks like a man, I mean that it's kind of like if you outlined a person and pressed the fill with a paint bucket in Photoshop. Like that shadow of a person, but like 3D. I don't know, this probably isn't the best way to describe it. I don't know what it could be. I don't know what think it's a demon or eventual spirit, because it never did anything crazy like that to me. I'm not sure what it could be. You guys can think I'm lying or whatever, but this is 100% true. And I didn't even believe it for a long time until my brother brought it up to me. My parents divorced when I was four, and my dad went to build his own house while I lived with my mom. My dad built this house on a site where the previous home had burned down three years earlier. It was arson, but no one was hit or killed, and the perpetrator never caught. Shortly after finishing the house, weird things began to happen. The first story is one I wasn't told until I was older. One night after the house was finished but not fully moved into yet, my dad was working late upstairs in the master bedroom. It was probably midnight or so, and he was finishing up when he began to hear voices. He described it as a group of people talking. He wouldn't make out any single conversation, just the general buzz of many voices coming from downstairs. Confused, he left the bedroom and stood on the landing, listening. The voices didn't stop, and they were coming from the living room. My dad grabbed a wrench, the only thing he had, and changed downstairs only to find nothing. However, the voices were still talking. He entered the living room and stood there, listening. He said it sounded like the voices were coming from the ceiling, like the group of people was super tall or something. He began to get scared and shouted at the voices to shut up, which they did. It just fell completely silent. My dad left for the night pretty quickly afterwards. The next thing is something I remember. Sometimes when my sister and I stayed over at my dad's, we would spend half a week with our mom and half a week with our dad. The smoke detector in our room would go off in the middle of the night. It never happened when we were with our mom, only when we were in the bedroom asleep at night with our dads. The smoke detector in our bedroom was also the only one to go off. No other detectors in the house would do anything. My dad tried replacing the battery and even replacing the whole thing, but it would continue to happen for a few years. I remember waking up in the night to the alarm blaring and running to my dad's room to tell him the alarm was going off again. This happened once a month or so for the first few years we lived in that house. Finally, this is something my entire family witnessed. We had motion detector lights on the stairs, leading to the basements. One night, we were in the living room, which had a perfect view of the stairs to the basement. We had a sheet in the doorway at the time, because my dad just hadn't put a door in yet. Suddenly, the motion lights on the stairs turn on, and the sheets move up, like someone lifted it to walk under and then let it go. Except, there was no one there. I remember being super freaked out, but my dad didn't seem worried, so I wasn't either. Years later, my dad told me he was actually terrified, but didn't want to scare my sister and I, so he pretended to be fine. The smoke detector was the only incident that kept happening, but after a few years, it stopped, and nothing creepy happened in that house again. We moved out when I was 14, and I haven't been back since. To our knowledge, no one has died on the land or been buried there, so I'm not sure what this all was.
Any feedback would be great. So I used to live in a council house before my mum moved in with stepdad. While living there, it was just me and my mum. I had three experiences living in that house. I'm glad to be out of there. Before I get to those stories, my former neighbour died while I was living in the place. The neighbourhood didn't know this until his garden started smelling and becoming untidy. He definitely didn't leave the house as one of us would have known. People knocked on his door to no avail. Eventually, the police were called and they broke into his house to find his body there. I can't remember how he died, but yeah, it may not be related to what happened to me. I'm a bit suspicious. Now, onto the experiences. So, once I had a late night, my mum went to bed and I went up like 5 to 15 minutes after. Anyway, I turned off my laptop and headed for the corridors. The doorway I was going to went to left. The kitchen, where besides that doorway was the front door and a staircase. And right, a little room where you top up the electricity with a key. I went left, obviously, since I was going to bed. Then the lights turn off, like some paranormal activity shit, and I saw a fucking white figure walking from the sink. I didn't full-on scream, but I did yelp, blinked, and everything was back to normal. When I think back to it now... I think that my mind was fucking with me. I'm a superstitious person, but I'm thinking of a rational explanation. But then, this experience... Oh, mighty God, this experience. So I was in bed, like 2 or 3 a.m., and I get out of bed for a piss, and before going into the toilet room, it's one of those bathrooms with a toilet only, I peek into my mum's room, and there's a fucking hand looming over my mum's head. And when I looked, it disappeared. Mind you... Nobody was in that fucking house but us. I, being the dumbass I was, went to the bloody toilet before warning my mum and said pissing myself. I used to work as a guide and then as backup, and even as a field director for several wilderness therapy programs for troubled kids in Arizona, Utah and Idaho. They were all good jobs, but when I worked in Utah, it was in the West Desert south of Dugway. It's possibly the ugliest and creepiest part of Utah. Tons of sketchy stuff happened to us out there. This story happened in 2005. The groups were camped in a really nice area for that part of the desert, called Indian Canyon. The spot was so nice, in fact, that in the late 1800s or early 1900s, some enterprising pioneer families had built themselves a little homestead with a one-room cabin and a small barn and a cedar pole fence around the perimeter of the little farm. All of that, of course, now was a crumbling, rotten ruin. The cabin, it seemed, had burned down well over 50 years ago. And what remained of the barn was poking out of the grass in two or three foot shards of grey wood scattered all over the near vicinity. This week, I was also camped in Indian Canyon, but further down the road. I was manning the infield emergency response vehicle, or the ERV, better known as backup. A new position I helped invent when I took a list of things that had gone wrong in the field to the directors and explained that because of the horrible response time and the spotty satellite phone service, the only reason we weren't shut down or that people weren't dead was because we were lucky. Not because we were prepared or efficient at responding to emergencies. Now we had radios and someone listening to them 24-7, never more than a few minutes away with a vehicle. That's how it works in theory, anyway. One of the boy groups was camped at the mouth of the canyon, in the foothills about two miles away from me. The other is just a mile beyond them. The girls were close too. I was camped somewhere in the middle of the canyon on top of a small ridge that had a little jeep track side road branching off of the main dirt road running up the canyon. And the girls were just a couple of ridges over, maybe a mile away. Though to drive to them, I'd have to back out to the main road and take a different jeep trail up to their spot. Maybe a five mile trip. I was about a mile and a half below the staff training group that was being headed up by my wife Jessica. Divorce now. 
there were going to be several groups of parents coming out to visit their kids later in the week. So both the boys group and the girls group, all on that side of the mountain, had all elected to stay put for a few days and work on building pack packs and gathering fire sets and a lot of other primitive skills. The training group had been in the field for almost a week and they were getting ready to split up and go join the student groups for the last several days of their training. This left me with less to do than normal. I didn't have to find new sites for groups or drop anyone's water or food. Everyone was well taken care of and no one was moving for several days. I decided to build a sweat lodge next to the creek, up near where the new staff were camped. I found the perfect spot, well out of sight of the group, on a little smooth sandbar right by the water. I got to work. I harvested some long willow saplings that were bendable enough to weave a frame with and arranged them in a 10 foot circle, digging down a foot and a half for each one to anchor in the sand. I bent them into a dome four feet high and 10 feet across and wove the branches together with supporting crossbars until I had a structure that I probably could have stood on without breaking it. I walked down to the truck which I had hidden in some pine trees a quarter of a mile away and hauled a large bin of tarps and cow hides and plastic sheeting along with my fire sets and some other gear up to the lodge. As I was walking back to the creek I remember feeling like someone was following me but when I stopped and looked I couldn't see or hear anything. It was a beautiful day for July. The morning had started out with some high wispy cloud cover but that had long since burned off and the noon sun was high overhead. It wasn't too hot however. I was high enough in the mountains that the oppressive heat that I knew was slowly baking the kids group in the desert below wouldn't reach me for another couple of hours. I set to work placing hides first on my little domed frame. I covered those with some tarps and plastic sheeting and secured it all so that I had as close to an airtight and waterproof shelter as possible, with only a small arched opening for a door. I secured an old military poncho over the door so that once hot rocks had been placed inside, it could be sealed shut and the sweat ceremony could take place. I wanted it to be as hot as possible. There wouldn't be any children involved in this one, so we would go as hot as we wanted. I took the extra time around the base of the lodge to bury all the edges of the coverings deep in sand. This was as sturdy a shelter structure as I had ever built. It was nice. I spent a good hour gathering sage and juniper and covered the floor of the lodge with a thick padding of the fragrant plants. I did this in part so that it was a soft place to sit for an extended time, but mostly I did it because I was intending to invite the new staff down to a sweat ceremony later to help some of them prepare to meet actual students for the first time. And frankly, a group of unwashed men and women who hadn't showered in a week in July, all crammed inside a sweltering homemade dome tent sweating buckets, is a smell that should not be endured without as much sage and juniper as possible. If it was really bad, which it was likely to be, I would rub some of it into my shirt and then pull it up over my nose and breathe through it. I went hunting for lava rock. I found an outcropping of small rounded boulders, perfect for heating on a bonfire, and then rolling into the lodge, and I proceeded to gather three onto a tarp. It was heavy, almost too much for me to sling over my back and carry, but I managed to make it back to the fire pit I had dug with all three. I left them there and went to gather more. I made this a smaller load because it's not like I was in a hurry. I could take more trips. When I got back to the fire pit, one of my rocks was gone. I just stared at the small depression in the sand where I had placed it minutes before and then looked around for signs that someone, possibly one of the staff from the group, had come and taken it. No tracks. I looked around again and spotted it by the edge of the creek 20 feet away. I had that feeling again, like I was being watched, but I couldn't see anyone in the trees. I walked over and retrieved my stone, the heaviest one I had carried, and put it back with the others. Maybe it had rolled there, through the flat, soft, dry land? I gathered a bunch more rocks, and none of them went missing, 
and then I built a fire. As I worked, that weird feeling of being watched came back. Only this time, it felt more ominous, like it was mad at me for being there. I stood up, determined to walk out in the woods and find whoever it was. The radio, which I kept on and strapped to my belt, had been silent all day, but it suddenly crackled to life. Brian and the boys group doing some evening check-in a little early so they could do their day hike without having to stop and contact me. After we talked, I felt more normal again. I cooked some rice and beans for dinner, and as they cooled off, I piled my stones, probably 30 of them, into a can in the center of the fire, and then just piled all, all the dry wood and brush I could gather. I took my knife out of my sheath because that feeling was back, still worse this time. As soon as my fire became almost irresponsibly big, I saw someone moving fast through the trees, straight towards me. I tensed, then relaxed. Will, a seasoned staff working the training group with Jessica and Katie, came running down the creek. He stopped when he saw me and my sweat lodge and my ten foot tall flames and broke into a huge grin. I thought it was a wildfire, he said. Some of the new girls are panicking. Nope, just an epic sweat lodge, I said. I was planning on inviting you all down for it when you called in. But I'll consider this your check-in. If you guys want to, you're all invited to come sweat. It'll be ready in about half an hour. Perfect, he said. They're just finishing up dinner. I'll go get Katie and Jess. No one will be down. He turned to walk away. Hey, Will, he turned back around. Did you guys lose track of any of the new guys today? Or did one of you three come down this way? He thought for a moment and said, No, I don't think so. Why? It's nothing, I said. I just thought someone might have come looking for me when I was out gathering rocks. Some of my stuff was in a different place and I remember leaving it, is all. He looked at me with an odd expression. Weird, he said finally. I'll ask everyone, but we've kept pretty busy today, so I don't know when someone would have come down this far. It's okay, I said. Don't stress about it. I was just wondering. See you in a few minutes. The other two kids' groups radioed me shortly after. Will walked off. It was more like an hour before the staff group finally trudged into my little sandy clearing. Some of them looked excited, and some of them looked confused at my dome of plastic and sand, and at my pile of glowing red boulders on the still blazing fire, and at the stack of blue five-gallon water jugs I hauled down from the truck for the experience. We thought we were going to die in a forest fire, one of the new girls, Carol Sue, said accusingly. She looked extra smelly. I pulled some essential oils out of my possible bag. A possible bag? It's just a type of leather purse we make on the trail that we call possible bags to disguise the fact that we're in fact grown men who carry around purses. Put some of this on your wrists and neck. It will help you keep a good frame of mind in the sweat. How many of you have done this before? A handful of them raised their hands. Inside of the circle of the lodge is a sacred place. We'll do four sessions going longer and longer each time. We will dedicate each session to a different part of our lives, our histories, our families, our struggles, and our choices. Try to only speak from the heart about these things. It will be very hot once we begin pouring water on the rocks, and the heat will make it very difficult to speak anyway. So only speak if it's important. Katie and Will were already rolling the superheated rocks into the lodge, using some long willow poles I'd made. I gave Jess a side hug. The trainees didn't know we were married, and we'd found it best to not let kids or people new to the wilderness know, because it could become a distraction from the experience if they got too caught up in our personal lives. So a side hug was all. And as far as they knew, we were just co-workers. I looked out a dried sage smudge and lit it on the fire and did the ritual smoke cleansing for each of them as they entered the hallowed ground. I made the last minute decision to not go into the sweat lodge. That last boys group had a student that was a little bit of trouble and I was worried I'd end up having to take an emergency radio call about a runner in the middle of someone's heartfelt speaking about their issues with their family or their past. Also the smell. Also, something just felt off. This was a perfect spot and a perfect time for a sweat lodge ceremony, but it felt not wrong exactly, but off somehow. Instead, 
I whispered my choice and that maybe I'd join the next session to Katie as she was the last to enter. And I sealed the door up behind them, burying the edge of the poncho in the sand like the rest of the construction. I stood by the fire for a minute or two and felt hot. So I walked in the water down the narrow stream, about a hundred yards, and just looked at the stars that were slowly becoming more and more visible in the darkening twilight. I stood there for at least ten minutes, enjoying the changing sky. I heard a twig snap somewhere to my left, and the crickets went silent. There was definitely somebody away up in the trees. I stared hard and could not at first see anyone, but there was a small dark shadow under a pine. 30 or 40 feet away. Too dark for this early in the evening. Was that a girl in the shadow? It looked like a small Native American girl with two long braids and some kind of headband. I called out to her, but she didn't move. She seemed to be glaring at me, and the longer I stood there, the worse I felt. Like the warmth from the air around me was being sucked away. So I took a deep breath and did what I always do in the woods when something unknown scares me. I ran at it. Whoever was there took off fast, and I chased them. I lost them quickly enough. I'm not a runner, but I was sure they had been headed in the direction away from my little creekside sweat lodge. I must have gone an eighth of a mile, almost to the road when I heard all of the staff at the sweat lodge scream behind me. My blood ran cold, and I turned on my heel and sprinted back up the canyon. I almost missed the sweat lodge clearing when I came to it because nothing I saw made sense. The fire was out, not even a glow. The sweat lodge was gone. The tarps had all been pulled and ripped off and they and the hides that were flung out in a wide circle on the ground in the bushes and in the water. The frame was uprooted and folded over on its side to one side of the sandbar and all the new and experienced staff were sitting stunned in a circle on a padding of sage and juniper, around a pile of cold rocks. What happened? I yelled as I ran up. After a moment, Katie answered. We were just sitting here, starting to pour water on the rocks to heat things up. And we started talking a little about what it means to know your personal history. The walls of the sweat lodge started shaking, and we thought you were outside trying to get in. It stopped for a minute, and Jess called your name, but you didn't answer. And we had just poured some water on the rocks when the whole lodge went cold. Like, really cold. And it sounded like a massive windstorm blew in and ripped the whole thing off of us. Frame and all and threw it into the trees. I didn't know what to do, so I grabbed my bag and got out every flashlight I had. We started checking each other for injuries. I lied to them through my teeth and told them it was a microburst windstorm. And that they happen sometimes in Utah and that they were lucky no one got hurt and so on. And amid sceptical looks from the three of them who knew me, I got Jessica and Will to start taking the stunned newbies back to camp. But Katie stayed. Katie, who had been with me through so many other unexplainable things out there, knew what I was doing. She could tell. I wasn't saying something. The fire is out, like it's cold out. And it was a thousand degrees 20 minutes ago. And the rocks that were glowing hot 20 minutes ago feel like they've been sitting in the creek, she said. What are you not saying, Dan? I took a deep breath. I just tried to chase down a little Native American girl who can run unnaturally fast in the dark. Katie sat down hard. I looked at her, but she didn't say anything, so I continued. Today, while I was gathering rocks for the lodge, I felt someone was watching me the whole time, and I swear I'm not making this up. But I set down that really big rock, the first one you rolled into the circle. And I walked away for a few minutes. And when I returned, it was over by the creek. Like someone came and moved it, but there were no tracks and it couldn't have rolled there. Then after you all went into the sweat lodge, I walked down the creek and heard something in the trees. It took me a minute to spot her, but she was hiding in a shadow under a tree. I think I chased her for about 30 seconds when you all started screaming And I ran back up there. What Katie said next made me sit down too. Did she have two braids and a headband? I nodded slowly. Early this morning, like three in the morning, Jessica woke everybody up and said it was going to rain and that we needed to build a shelter. There were no clouds last night, I said. 
I know, said Katie, but she woke us all up and insisted that we needed to build a shelter and wouldn't drop it till we all moved closer together and put up some tarps. I like to see the stars if I wake up. So I moved in close just in case, but I didn't get under a tarp. Neither did Will or Josh. He's one of the new guys. Well, this morning, just before it got light, I had a really disturbing dream where I felt like I was awake in my sleeping bag and was staring up into the tree above me. And there was this little native girl with two braids and a blue slash gray headband up in the tree over my face staring at me. I knew I was dreaming, but I couldn't move or wake up. I was only able to move when Josh, on the other side of the shelter, yelled and sat up. I thought it was just a horrible dream until I talked to Jess about the rain last night. She admitted to me that she hadn't been worried about rain, but that she had been dead asleep when she felt someone reach into her sleeping bag and shove her head to the side. She panicked and laid there and pretended like she was still sleeping, but they knelt over her face for a few minutes. She said she was terrified to open her eyes. When she felt them leave, she waited for a few minutes and then woke everyone up. I was wondering why she slept in the middle of everyone. Now it makes sense. I was quiet. Katie spoke again. Before breakfast, I asked Josh why he yelled and sat up. I was grateful he did, but curious as to why. He told me he'd had a horrible nightmare about a little Native American girl. And when he thought he woke up, he saw her running at him. He yelled and she jumped over his head and took off. That's when he really woke up and sat up. He was surprised I heard him yell. He thought he was still asleep at that point and he dreamed the yelling part. I didn't tell Jess or Josh what happened to me and I didn't tell them about each other. But at breakfast, Will told all of us about his horrible dream about a little girl dying in that cabin when it burned down. We all freaked out. That's all we've been talking about today. Half of the group didn't believe us. And Carol Sue, the loud annoying one, has told everyone that we're just trying to haze the new guys. Even Josh, who's a new guy, is onto it apparently. And then the sweat lodge thing happened. With what you just told me, I don't think any of us were dreaming. We were quiet for a long time. I think we should move camp down the road tomorrow, I finally said. I'll clean up this mess in the morning. Katie just nodded and stood up. Oh, and Katie, it's probably a good idea for everyone to be under the shelter to sleep tonight. And also, maybe don't light another fire. I'm guessing the one at your group site is out too. She sighed tiredly and walked off into the dark. I just sat there for a while and then slowly made my way back to the truck. I didn't feel like anyone was watching me anymore, but that didn't stop me from sleeping in the cab with the doors locked for the rest of the week. There was a house in my area that burnt down several years ago, when I was still a child and living in my old house. There were no reported deaths, but I beg to get differ. When I was around 12 years old, and whilst the house was still relatively fresh from the fire, me and a friend decided to go inside and explore it for whatever reason. There was an unlocked window which we climbed through, and although my memory is a bit hazy, I do remember the staircase being black and ashen the walls and ceiling ripping apart, etc. I also remember walking into a room, which looked like a child's room. There was a framed picture of two girls, some family photos and whatnot. Me and my friend left soon after. The house got remodeled, and frankly, I forgot about it. Came a few years later. Me and my family moved from our old, small house into a new, two-story house in our area that we still live in to this day. And you guessed it, it's that same house that burnt down. Now, things were fine for a few years. I didn't experience anything weird. That, however, changed around two years ago, when I began seeing and hearing things, mainly in my room and occasionally around the house as well. It started off with voices, especially when I was going to sleep. I have no history of any mental health issues, so this was a new occurrence to me. I'd be lying on my side, trying to go to sleep, and I would hear a woman's voice singing into my ear. She would sing, whisper unintelligible things, sometimes speak to me, 
but I could never make out anything she was saying. It was the most surreal thing ever, because it would be as though she was right next to me, or above me. But every time I'd turn around to see who's there, nobody would be. This then escalated to hearing voices of two girls. It wouldn't be in my ear as before, and rather around the entire room. They would sing kids songs, rhymes, etc. I then began hearing constant knocking on my door, and the floor creaking in my room as though someone was walking around. I even called out a few times to see if anyone was there. I'd ask my sister if she was at my door, and she'd always say no. This went on for a while, before I actually began to see her. Not the kids, but the woman. I'd see her all the time, and they'd always be split second glances, and she would disappear. She would be in the creepiest places and positions too. A lot of the time, I'd see her in the corners of the ceiling in my room, right above my bed. On all fours, and clutching into the ceiling. I saw her like this as I walked past my sister's room as well. I'd see her walking down the stairs, head down, hand on the rail. Sometimes she would stand in my room and just look at me. Again, I would only ever see her for a second at most, but it's so vivid in my memory. Weird thing is, she's never scared me. Sure, the knocking and voices freaked me out at first, but when I began actually seeing her, there was no fear at all. It was quite calming, actually. I tried to talk to her sometimes, too. She'd obviously never respond. Nowadays, I haven't seen her much. The kids' chants have gone, but I still occasionally hear her whispering or humming into my ear when I'm about to sleep. I move rooms as well, so maybe that's why. Sometimes I do end up sleeping in my old room, and those are the nights where I hear her the most. My cat, however, still stares at the door, and the ceiling, and at an empty spot in my room. Sometimes she hisses, sometimes she just meows. I've told my mum my experience, and my sister. Both haven't seen or heard her specifically, but they both believe me, and think something is wrong with the house. A couple of months ago, I moved into an old house, built in 1902, and I felt something was there. I just didn't know how active what I felt would be. At first it was small things, windows not being open or shut like how I left them, doors opening on their own, footsteps down the hallway when it was just my cats and I home. Like I said, small stuff, but things have grown more active in the past week. I've been poked and had someone say my name as if trying to get my attention. I went into my room right after and it got real cold, real fast. This was the first contact he attempted to make. The days following this, I felt an uneasy feeling, as if it was unwelcome and it was being glared at. This feeling wasn't constant, but I could feel where it was coming from, which let me know where he was. Footsteps became louder, banging could be heard throughout the day in various rooms, although never my room. My cats seemed to love my room and often claw the door until I let them in. Once they got in my room, they refused to leave, hissing at the hallway as I get them out of my room. I believe there was just one spirit in my home, but last night left no doubt that there were at least two. I was laying down for bed, watching TV at a very low volume. All of a sudden, clear as day, right in my ear, Hey! I froze from the shock of a female voice loudly whispering in my ear. I keep watching my show, ignoring it. Then again, Hey! More drawn out than the first time. I keep my eyes forward, but I see someone standing at the foot of my bed, out of the corner of my eye. She disappeared after a few minutes. She didn't feel malicious, but her energy definitely felt authoritative. A minute later, my cat started zooming as they do, but I heard footsteps following theirs, and I was the only one awake. About one and a half years ago, I was home alone and had no pets at the time. Nice setup for a ghost I know. And now, it wasn't 3am, it was around 8pm if I remember correctly. I was sitting in my room watching a movie, with the door to my room closed as always. 
Suddenly, I hear the sound of the door handle being violently pushed down, and then I can already see the door slamming opening into the wall. After a sec of shock, I thought that my mom or sister were home already, so I called out for them, but I didn't hear anything, so I looked for them. But after a few minutes, I realised they weren't home yet, and the door was still locked. So I looked out of the window to see if they wanted to prank me, but no car was in sight. I checked everything that somehow could have caused the door handle to be pushed down and slammed open. But nothing is lying on the ground next to the bookshelf, nor are any windows open, so I couldn't even explain how the door even slammed open after that. I am and always have been a huge sceptic, but that is the one experience I was never able to explain. If some of you got any ideas on how that could have happened, I'd be thankful, since believing in ghosts didn't exactly make my fears disappear. Until the opossum incident in 2018, I had never experienced anything paranormal in my life, much to my dismay. I wanted entities to present themselves to me, so I called for them. I was a weird kid. As I recall, I only ever asked though. I never taunted or tried to offend. I have some memories before the age of six, but six is really the age I remember becoming aware, self-aware, aware of the fact that other people process things differently, basically had my first existential crisis. I was overweight, even at six, and relentlessly bullied. Mom and dad had straight hair. I have extremely curly hair. Now I love it because I know how to maintain it after having some YouTube tutorials and the entire internet at my disposal. But as a kid with parents who had no idea about curly hair, I walked around with a rat's nest, unless my mom French braided it. The bullies told me to brush it, so I did for hours, which is why my hair was such a puffy, frizzy mess all the time. I digress. I was bullied relentlessly for my hair and weight. My parents were divorcing. I'm not even sure if I knew what suicide was at the time, but I do remember thinking that if I was dead, I wouldn't have to deal with this. I believe I was depressed at six years old in 2001, not just sad. It got worse in 2007 and worse again in 2015. Looking back, I legitimately don't know how I'm alive. For 19 years, suicide was my first thought waking up every morning. April 2018, my mom died. I was the one who found her, and she was my best friend, so it was rough. Tragedy followed. Dude, I was seeing ghosts, me, but in comparison to the other things, it seemed so trivial. My best friend overdosed to death, and my Pompty dog was attacked and died in my arms. And in November 2019, I lost my job because I was essentially coming to work, getting very little actual work done spending the day trying to hide constant crying and panic attacks in my cubicle. In any case, I was at rock bottom, just numbly existing. Didn't even have the desire to actively end my life anymore. I was just waiting for malnutrition or negligence to kill me. And then, it all went away. 19 years of chronic suicidal depression, gone. I wish I could bottle it and sell it and end all the sadness in the world. I'm now one of the happiest people I know. I literally love life and wake up smiling every morning. To me, there's literally no explanation other than this crazy one that finally ties back into the paranormal. What if I had some sort of entity affecting me from a young age? I got to thinking of this because of a comment in this sub encouraging a poster to ward off the evil entities they felt as these entities can cause lifelong depression. That to us is purely that. Depression. No paranormal overtones or vibes from it. When I google ghosts causing depression, I'm encouraged to be evaluated for my mental health. But I've read a few interesting things that bore no google results. When I try to dig deeper. I don't know if that's because commenters pull things out of their ass, or they're just such niche topics. No one else is talking about them. What if my mom's spirit found the entity causing depression and took care of it for me? Is that possible? Is that plausible? 
Am I completely crazy and need to get help for even considering that this could be real? Did this happen in a book or movie that I forgot about and I'm now applying it to my life? My mom was my best friend and I her caretaker as she became wheelchair bound from a rare neurological condition when I was 14 in 2008. I was probably about 17 when this happened, so summer of 2012. I was up late with her just talking and watching TV. This is Texas, so despite being 2am it was still 90 degrees and I decided to walk up to the gas station to get us some cokes. I always enjoyed quiet, hot, late night walks to the gas station. It was peaceful and I never felt scared because I'd made the trip hundreds of times. I'd pass an empty parking lot from about 50 feet away and with the street illuminated by only nearby porch lights and the street lights, I'd clearly see a tiny pair of glowing greenish yellow eyes staring at me. A couple seconds later, several more pairs of glowing eyes turn on me all just a few inches from the first pair. I never stop walking, but I maintain focus with the eyes until I'm out of range, for fear that whatever it is could charge at me. In my head, I was picturing a fat black cat, but it could have been a massive cat. On my way back from the gas station, it was gone. Back home, I recounted the eyes to my mom over cokes and snacks, and she was shocked to hear that I'd never seen a wild possum before, given how incredibly common they are to the area. She said they're all over the place in town, but stay hidden very well and act nocturnal. She said they can even have two dozen babies at a time, and that I saw a mama and her babies out on the prowl. And they were, of course, more scared of me than I was of them. I love animals and the possums are cute, so it absolutely made my day that I had seen this little family of opossums. I started looking them up on my phone, and my mum and I talked about them and read about them for several hours, because that's just the kind of stuff we did together. In 2014, I moved across town into a house alone, but I'd still go see my mum every other day after work. April 4th, 2018, I found her peacefully passed in bed. Stage 4 kidney disease made its claim on my mum's life. The doctor that came to pronounce her explained to me that when an organ fails, it causes the heart to stop working and assured me that any pain is not long lasting and is a very quick way to go. 10 years of suffering due to the neurological conditions plus the kidney disease was more than I expected to get with my mom. She was ready to go long before that and I think she fought to stay for me but just couldn't suffer anymore. I had not seen an opossum since that night in 2012. Three days since my mom had passed and I was still in the shock stage. I was destroyed inside and I hadn't eaten or spoken to anyone. Just cried and slept and stressed out about taking in my mom's dogs, which I was completely unprepared for, but did not trust anyone else to love and care for them. It was late, about 2am and hot. I had the dogs outside to go potty for a while and decided it was time to bring them in. After I got them in, I got the urge to turn back around and open the back door again and look outside again, so I did. The back wooden fence is only about 8 feet away from my perch at the back door. To my right, about 10 feet away, there's a tree that grows at the corner of the fence and the branches hang down and cover the corner of the fence. From the branches, I notice a slight rustling following the glare of glowing green eyes. Out ambles a fat opossum. It treks clumsily over the wooden fence, occasionally looking up and glancing at me. I'm frozen in disbelief. It reaches the point of the fence and directly across from me, stops and stares directly at me. I say hi, and it turns back the way it came and slowly makes its way and disappears back into the tree branch at the corner of my fence. Those are the only two times in my life I've ever seen an opossum. I think my mom had a short chance to say goodbye and bring me comfort as an opossum. My mom and I also loved birds. They were our favourite animal. We were going to move down south and be bird watchers when I retired. 
We knew she, she wouldn't live that long, but it was the fantasy we always dreamed of. My neighbourhood is full of stray cats, so unfortunately, we don't get a lot of birds. A couple of weeks later, my bereavement leave from work ended. The very first day I went back to work, I stepped out the front door and walked up to the car, to be distracted by the very distinct voices of two birds. I look directly up, and on the power line above me is a blue jay and a cardinal sitting together. I had never seen a cardinal before, and blue jays were a rare treat to get to see. But I hadn't seen so much as a crackling or sparrow in the neighbourhood because of the cats. Maybe it's just the grief, but I feel as if my mom had something to do with the birds too, and it only adds to my belief that she intercepted a possum to say goodbye to me. I'll start by saying that my mom, grandmother and I are pretty familiar with the paranormal and that we've had our fair share of strange experiences to this day. I've always been someone interested in the paranormal, even though it scares me a bit. I've had many experiences since I was around six or seven years old, but I'll start by sharing with you guys something that happened to me three days ago. So here it goes. It was last Sunday. I just came home from my boyfriend's place at around eight o'clock at night. I went to my room to sit back and relax and decided to light a candle for a little ambience. All of a sudden, the candle flame became really tall and agitated. So much so that I checked if I had left my window open. It wasn't. My door was closed as well, so no possibility of a draft except affecting the candle. By saying that the flame was tall, I mean a good 15 to 20 centimeters long. Very unusual for a rather small candle, whose mesh had been trimmed before. The fame flickered and stayed that long for minutes, never returning to its usual length and strength. I then decided to ask questions to see if the candle flame would react, since it has been said to me that when a candle flame does this for a long time, a spirit or presence is near. I started asking if anyone was there. The flame flickers a lot. I waited to see if it was a coincidence, but it didn't seem like it. I then had an idea. I have three pendulums that I use for divination. So I took one of the three, went back to the candle and asked again if anyone was there. The pendulum started moving clockwise, which means a yes. I waited for the pendulum to become steady again and proceeded to ask if it was someone I knew. There again, the pendulum started moving clockwise, so yes. I waited for it to stop moving and asked for if it was someone from my family and the answer I got was yes. I then asked if it was there to watch over my family and it said yes. Finally, I asked if it wanted to continue communicating with me and the pendulum started moving counterclockwise, meaning a no. I then thanked it and said goodbye. As soon as I said goodbye, the candle flame returned to normal, burning steadily with a length of two to three centimeters. For a good part of the night, I heard the floorboards just outside my room creaking, as if someone was there. Both my parents and my brother were already asleep, and my dog was in my parents' room. The next day, when I told my parents what happened, my dad was surprised and told me that our dog was pretty agitated for a part of the night, which wasn't usual for her. He said she seemed a bit scared of something. For the past four days now, starting on April 10th, whenever I'm sitting on my couch in the living room, out of the corner of my eye, I see a lady dressed in an all white robe. I usually dismiss it as a trick of the eye or a curtain flowing, but each time the family dog, who never barks at anything, rushes the door and goes insane. Every time I notice and turn my head to look, she's gone, except for one time I saw her and looked into her eyes. Her face was kind of her eyes. Not really eyes and not really face either. Also not really so much a female but feminine, but something alike to them. They were soft but dangerous, like this thing is powerful and yet gentle. I've grown up in a fairly religious Christian household and have always been really sensitive to spirits and general intentions. Ask me why I hate going to moat churches. 
Her intentions feel protective, and I've only ever caught a glance of her as she paces our porch in front of our door. So I'm not so much scared of her, but scared of her presence and its meaning. I've tried to think of anything out of the ordinary, such as a new item in the house or a deviation from normal schedule or something. Anything really. But nothing. The only thing I can possibly think of is Friday, April 9th night, into Saturday, April 10th morning. There was a severe storm that blew down a really, really old tree in our neighbours across the street from us. Front yard. Before this, I was sceptical about paranormal stuff and didn't give it much credit, but kept an open mind. I have no dealings with witchcraft or rituals or anything to do with a Ouija board. My girlfriend has been supportive and has experienced many of the same things I have, and some of her own. In March of 2020, I bought my first home and everything was fine until a few months in. At first, it was confined to electronics powering off so I wasn't really clued into something paranormal at first. I'll spare you my list, but there were things moved around the house, doors found open, scratching heard in the walls, glass bottles on the fridge jingling, and the area fan in my bedroom was found turned on multiple times. The three instances that really make me uneasy are the ones I can't pin on the pets. Midwinter, I was at my gaming desk and all of a sudden, I got an intense campfire smoke smell. I immediately ran down to the furnace room, hoping nothing was on fire, but couldn't smell smoke anywhere else in the house. And it was gone when I returned to my room. I live in town, and the two adjacent neighbours do not have a wood-burning furnace. Just last week, I went to the kitchen to grab a soda, and at the bottom of the stairs, I smelled an intense lavender perfume. I asked my girlfriend if she had been ambitious with her mojo before leaving, and she hadn't applied any perfume that night. The smell lingered in a singular spot for a bit, and I haven't smelled the perfume or the campfire smoke since. The last is what happened last night. I worked the night shift and come home to get the dogs out on my lunch break. After letting the dogs out, I'm eating in my office. I hear a muffled thud from downstairs. I immediately check where the cats are and they're right beside me begging for handouts. I dismissed it and finished my lunch. When I walked back into the kitchen, I found the little carpeted mat that sits in front of the oven, square in the middle of the kitchen. This I cannot explain away, or pin on the pets as they were not in the kitchen at all, and the rug wasn't there when I walked in and made lunch. I'm from New York City. A week ago, my father's best friend of 15 plus years was murdered in a hit and run, and it made the news on the Daily News website. I've seen and experienced the paranormal my whole life, nothing quite like this. My dad's friend Jackie died tragically. He was run down by an impatient driver. The driver parked their car and left, leaving Jackie pinned under the car. He was dragged for 50 feet. It seemed like he was gonna survive, but he passed away at Bellevue Hospital. My father told me the news on Monday. I only met Jackie when I was a kid, 13. I'm 23 now. I had no connection to him, and I only knew him as my dad's best friend slash co-worker. I was distraught at first because my dad was in pain, and I've never seen him that way before. That same evening, around 10 p.m., I started to feel agitated, angry, and in denial. I knew I was feeling pretty neutral, but for some reason, I was angry and confused. I tried to brush it off and went to lie down in bed to relax. I'm wide awake. I suddenly become very cold, but the heat was on in my home, so I had no reason to be freezing. I then began to go numb and felt something enter my body. I heard his last two loud heartbeats and something left my body. I got up fast and I heard someone whisper and ask, why? In my left ear. I never experienced this before, and after that day he hung around near me, and in my home for at least two days, and I felt his emotions and all the stages of grief. Anyway, I wanted to share this experience. I've never really told anyone except for my mother 
and she has a gift where she can see, hear, and talk to spirits better than I can. So she was able to validate my experience for me and had her own experience with Jackie as well. It's been a week since he passed and his funeral is later today. I hope he gets justice and they find the person who hurt him. When I was 11, our old home was haunted. We would see shadows, our things would move or go missing. We would get touched aggressively and we would hear people have conversations at night. But we lived in an isolated industrial area. We barely had neighbors. At 12 years old, my parents had taken me to a medium and she confirmed our experiences and even let us know that something dark was attached to us. At the same time, I was angry for no reason and I hated everything and everyone. I was also suicidal, even though I knew I loved life and my family. When I was outside the home, I actually felt normal and happy. I was getting attacked emotionally and physically. Something would try to pull my covers, so I would fall off the bed and I would wake up unaccounted for bruises. I was beat and I couldn't sleep anymore. If I did it, it was for a few hours. The medium had confirmed that this was a demonic entity and it was sent to us purposely. My family was suffering because we didn't know how to fight something we can't see. As the energy in our home got worse, my parents thought it was best that we move. We moved into a new home and it felt good to live in a place with good energy. A couple of months into our move, my dad decided to get his parents a visa to visit the US, even though he knew his parents didn't like us or my parents' marriage. He did his best to give them everything they didn't have. Also, my dad was in denial about his mother's feelings and behavior. They stayed in our home for six months when my grandma would make lunch. She didn't like when we ate her food. They took over my parents' room and told my mom to sleep on the futon. Of course, my mother swallowing her pride, she accommodated. My grandma didn't like when we would go into the room, our parents' room, because we were intruding. They finally left and activity started to pick up again. Again, we would see the shadows, but this time they would come out the mirror. The furniture would creak as if someone applied pressure to it, and you felt as if you weren't alone, even though you were. My mom had stated this is happening because of my grandma, but of course my dad didn't believe it. My mom and my sister began to talk, curse and scream while they're sleeping. I started to get sleep paralysis again and would get scratched in threes and I would have bruises again. I couldn't sleep or experience my new home in peace. My grandparents had visited again two more times. The last time, they waited till my dad was at work and they packed their things and left. Their excuse for that was my mom. My mom did her best even though they would belittle her in her own house. My dad was heartbroken because he was doing his best to provide and they disowned him. In 2019, my mom had traveled to Mexico to say her goodbyes to a dying cousin. People in the village had let my mother know that my grandma was a bruja, witch, and she was going known for doing bujeria, dark magic. And she would let people know that my mother wasn't the woman for her son. While my mom was gone, I was being attacked. Things were being thrown aggressively and photos of my mother fell off the shelf. Whatever was in our home was waiting till my mom was far away to hurt me and my little brother. When my mom came home, she let my dad know and she was devastated. He felt guilty because they were using him and because she was mean to us. We consulted another medium and she came to our home and confirmed that something was sent to our home to hurt us. We found out that my grandma had stolen some of our knickknacks. She had left her personal things in our house and hid them in the closet. And she also left dark magic work in our backyard, behind the shed and in the dirt. It turns out she had been cursing us for years, but we just can't seem to get rid of the work that she's done. I went to visit my grandma and she hugged me and cried crocodile tears because she missed me so much. I've been experiencing this since I was a kid and I'm 22 now. I know it's a demonic entity because I've seen it in its form and I've seen others too. They still haunt me and attack me to this day. They like to follow me from home to my boyfriend's house. 
When I sleep, they're in my dreams, and they like to hold me down when I'm in sleep paralysis mode. I do my absolute best to protect myself spiritually, and I feel less scared and stronger now. Whatever my grandma did is wrong, strong, but I was told that when one demon knows you, they all know you. I hate that this is my life, and I don't seem to know anything else beside it, and don't have anywhere to confide in. I'll start by saying that my uncle, my mother's brother, had been quite ill for some time and was living in Guadalajara, Mexico. My family lives in Southern California. I haven't seen him in 20 years since we couldn't afford to take the whole family to Mexico for regular visits, but we would speak here and there throughout the years. On Easter Sunday, my husband and I were putting up a new gate he and my son made the day before. I turned around to grab a tool and saw a tall, dark man with messy, curly hair walking toward me from the back of my yard. He came around me and then disappeared. Full disclosure, I see figures quite a bit often, so this doesn't really scare me. When my husband came back, I told him about the man and described him. He didn't recognize him, but we joked that it may have been a noisy spirit wanting to see the construction happening at the house. Later that day, I took my kids to my brother's house where my mom is currently staying. She received a call from my aunt, her sister, but my mom didn't want to answer right away. She wanted to play with the grandkids and said she would call her later. After I got home, my brother called and said my aunt had called to try and tell us our uncle Rito died earlier that day. My mother was devastated. After speaking with her and consoling her, I remembered my encounter with the dark figure. I searched through some old pictures. As I said, I only had 20 year memories of my uncle and I realized that who visited me except for one thing. My uncle was short, maybe five, eight tall. And this person was about six feet tall, but they both had curly disheveled chair, had a bit of a pot belly, but still thin in the shoulders and legs. I haven't told my mother because I don't want to make her feel bad, but I think it may comfort her to know that her brother came by to say a final hello and goodbye. When I was growing up, whenever my brothers or I were too sick for school, we'd be expected to stay in bed and rest. No TV, no video games, and this was long before smartphones were a thing. My mother was a nurse and she would stay home to care for us. She would come into my room periodically and ask if I needed anything and monitor my temperature. If I'd been sleeping, I would sometimes wake to the sound of her opening the door. I would then hear her footsteps on the carpet as she crossed the room and I would feel her sit down on the edge of the bed. After a moment, I would feel her place her warm hand on my forehead to check whether I might have a fever. I would then either open my eyes and have a small chat, or sometimes just fall back to sleep without saying anything. The routine had been the same way my whole life. One day, when I was 13 or 14, I was homesick. I'd been napping on and off throughout the day, and it was now mid-afternoon. My mum would come in to check on me four or five times. I was lying on my side with my eyes closed, and I heard the door open. I heard footsteps walking across the room. I felt my mom sit on the edge of the bed, the soft mattress dipping dramatically beneath her and the blankets pulling tight across my shoulder. I waited to feel her hand on my forehead, but it never happened. I opened my eyes and turned to look at her, only to see that no one was there. I was confused. I shrugged it off and went back to sleep. Fast forward a few weeks. It was the middle of the night, on a school night. I was roused from my sleep by the sound of my door opening. I heard footsteps walk across the room. I felt mum sit on the edge of my bed, the mattress dip, the blankets pull tight. I wasn't sick at the time, but even if I had been, I don't recall mum ever coming in to check in the middle of the night. I figured something must have been wrong, so I asked, what's wrong? No answer. I reached over and turned on my lamp. No one was there. 
I was confused again, once again shrugging it off and going back to sleep. Fast forward a few more weeks. It was the morning and I was getting ready to leave for school. I used to ride my bike to school, but on that day, mum insisted on driving me. It was just me and her in the car. As we neared the school, she pulled over to the side of the road and asked me if I'd noticed anything weird lately. I asked her what she meant and she gave it vague, just anything weird. I told her about the couple of I could have sworn mum was coming into my room and sitting on my bed incidents. Not really sure if that was the sort of thing she had in mind. She then told me that one of my brothers had been experiencing the same thing. After that, things got a bit more distressing. I would sometimes hear what sounded like footsteps walking on the roof in the middle of the night. And I would get the sense that something dark would loom over me at night. It would feel like all four corners of my mattress were being sat on at once. Or sometimes, it would feel like something was lying beneath my bed and pushing up on the mattress from below. Going to bed became a source of great fear and anxiety. I'm sure some, if not most of these experiences, could have been my mind, fueled by fear and adrenaline, playing tricks on me. Sometimes I would hide under the covers. Sometimes I would hurl myself out of bed and flick on the light switch as I ran out of the room. These experiences persisted for months, and at the time, my younger brother was reporting his own terrifying nighttime experiences. I'm sure we were contributing to each other's fears, and the level of hysteria in the house was quite high at that time. The final part of this story happened one night, when I was home and my older brother was hundreds of kilometres away on a school camp. I was woken from my sleep when I felt something in my hair. I first thought it was a large spider or a cockroach crawling in my hair. I reached up with my hands and tried to catch it or brush it away. The sensation came back, something crawling through my hair, deep down near the roots, close to my scalp. I sat up in bed and with both hands ruffled through my hair until I was convinced that I had evicted all unwanted creepy crawlies. I sat still for a moment and didn't notice any more movement, so I lay back down and tried to get back to sleep. Suddenly, it felt like a hand grabbed my hair and gave it two or three violent tugs, and then let go. That terrified me. I pulled the blankets up over my head and kept them there for the rest of the night. In the morning, my older brother phoned us from his school camp. He was talking to mum when we mentioned that he'd had a bad night's sleep and had restored to wearing his beanie because it felt like something had been pulling his hair. I hadn't mentioned my hair pulling experience to anyone at that point. After that, my mum sought advice about what to do, had someone come and cleanse the house, and would regularly perform cleansing rituals herself, including smudging, reciting verses, and leaving Bibles out around the house. Things improved soon after that, and the nighttime encounters practically stopped. This happened around 20 to 25 years ago. I don't remember the exact year. I must have been around 10 to 13 years old, and my brother is two years older than me. When I was a kid, every year for the Easter school holidays, my family would go out camping on some land that my grandparents own. The best thing about it was having somewhere to legally ride our motorbikes. My older brother and I would often jump on our bikes and head off riding around the property together racing and making up silly games. One year, we were both out riding, but had gone separate ways. So at this time, I was on my own with nobody else in sight. Suddenly, I heard a voice say my name. I heard it clearly over the sound of the two-stroke bike engine, and it didn't sound muffled in through my helmet. It sounded more like it was being spoken directly into my ear, or as if I had headphones or earbuds in my ear. At first, I disregarded it, thinking it was some strange interaction of the exhaust sound, the ear cavity of the helmet, and the wind blowing across the helmet visor. Basically, some kind of auditory illusion. But I heard it again, and again. A woman's voice calmly saying my name as if to get my attention. 
It would occur when I was riding in one small area and nowhere else. I'd say the area was a radius of 50 to 75 meters. It was an area we had to pass through to get from camp to the motorbike trials and back. The voice persisted for days in the same spot and it increased its vocabulary. It would sometimes say my name, it would sometimes say, come home, and it would sometimes say, come to me, my name. It started to creep out, and I would feel anxious when approaching the area where it would happen. After a few days and me not saying anything about it to anyone, I was out riding with my brother, and he signalled for me to stop and pulled up right in the middle of the area I'd been hearing the voice. He turned his bike off and removed his helmet, so I did the same. We then had a short conversation where he asked if I'd been hearing anything weird and if so, what? I told him I'd been hearing a voice. He went pale. I described the voice and he said that it matched what he was hearing. I asked what the voice was saying to him and he told me it would say his name and call him to come to it. We rode back and told our parents. Dad came out riding in the area with us. He didn't hear anything. And we didn't hear anything while he was there either. We kept hearing the voice over the next few days, always saying the same things. I remember this happening just the one year, but I brought it up with my brother recently. And he seems to think it also happened in the same place the following year. Two years ago, I took my wife my father and son, then three, to visit my family in rural New England. They live on a small farm with buildings that date back to the 1700s, which have been restored and modernized, and a guest house which was built about 20 years ago. My cousin is a prolific photographer, and my auntie had decorated most of the rooms in the main house and guest house with her photos. We didn't notice much about the photos in the guest house when we first arrived, probably because we were all jet-lagged. The next morning, after a sound night's sleep, we were sitting in the main family room eating breakfast and making plans for the day, when I noticed that my son was keeping his head down and not answering my father whenever he spoke to him, which was unusual, because even at that young age, they were very close. I looked over to my dad and noticed that he was sitting in front of a photo of a room in a run-down house. The room had a large window with sunlight streaming in, casting shadows across the length of the room towards a dark corner. I got an uneasy feeling from the photo, but didn't think much of it. We finished breakfast and all got up from the table, and I noticed my son was walking in a wide arc around the end of the table where my father had been sitting. Again, Weird behaviour, but I just dismissed it as a weird three-year-old thing. Over the next day or so, I noticed him becoming more and more uneasy any time we were at the dining table and doing whatever he could to try avoid looking at the photo. I decided to ask him what was wrong, and he answered me very matter-of-factly. The bad man in the picture is looking at me. He's very cold and he's not nice. I looked back at the picture and got instant chills down my spine. There was no man in the picture, but I got the feeling there was more to it than an empty room. I decided to ask my cousin about the picture, and she told me that it was taken at an abandoned farm a bit further upstate. It was one of her favourite pictures, but had always given my aunt the creeps, so it was moved to the guest house. Over the next couple of days, whenever I would ask my son about it, he would say things like, the bad man is looking at me, he doesn't like me. He wants to hurt me. I didn't think much of it until we were going to bed one night and my son tripped and fell, seemingly for no reason, in the middle of the hall and started crying hysterically. When I asked him if he was okay, he said, the bad man hurt me on the leg. I checked his leg and sure enough, on the side of his leg, there was a large bruise that looked like he had been struck with a blunt object. I didn't want to play into his fears, but asked him, how could the bad man hurt him if he was in the photo downstairs near the table? His answer was enough for me to pack up all our shit and move to the main house, with my aunt, 
uncle, cousins, and big burly housekeeper right away. He's not down there. He comes up here when we go to bed. We left soon after, so I never found out anything more about the farm where the photo was taken. But I'm sure there was some kind of evil presence around it. I remember being 15 years old. I never really believed in ghosts or anything. I thought everything was just a wild coincidence. I was a skeptic, to say the least. One night, it was me, my girlfriend at the time, and a friend all in my room at night slash early morning. My girlfriend always slept with a pillow between her feet. Don't know why, but that was just her. So this night, my buddy was on my top bunk, while my girlfriend was on the lower one with me. And she felt something heavy on her legs, right where the pillow was. And for some reason, all of us were kind of freaked out. My buddy comes down. I go to the corner of my bed with my girlfriend. My buddy just goes to the other corner and grabs the pillow that was between her feet and places it near the edge of the bed and suddenly says, if there's anything in this room, sit down on the pillow. Me being me at the time, did not believe a damn thing and just kept my cool. And was basically saying everybody is acting ridiculous while simultaneously looking at the pillow. Literally a few seconds later, there's a butt print going down on the pillow in front of all three of us. And at that point, my body felt cold. I was too afraid to scream or do anything. My girlfriend was beyond scared and my friend just began to cry. None of us knew what to do. And we ran out of my room to my outside yard and just spoke about what we saw to make sure we all weren't going crazy. I'm 31 now, and will never forget that day. Although that was my first encounter, I've had plenty directly after. Just speaking about this gives me goosebumps and still scares me. It makes me feel uneasy. And I felt compelled to just let it out, hoping it would give me a moment's peace. As a kid, I would see things that might have been spirit guardians, angels, demons, ghosts, who knows? Random people or creatures seemed to visit me. Some only came at night, but plenty came during the day. I had a huge crush on a classmate of mine, this cute guy named Kevin. He wouldn't say much, but he'd wave at me sometimes or ask me to play with him. One night, I dreamt he was hit by a train and certain organs were missing. I went to school and wanted to tell him about it, but he didn't show up. In fact, I never saw him again. But when I asked about him, neither my classmates nor my teacher knew who I was talking about. For the next thing, I'd like to add that I was born with some version of synesthesia, which causes me to see colours around every living thing. It allows me to kind of see emotions. Sounds weird, right? Well, it is. But what's weirder to me are the visuals that aren't li linked to anything living. A guy I knew once took me to a park near his house. I'd never been there before and didn't know this guy very well. I told him about this stuff and he asked me if I saw anything in the park. I pointed out four spots in the park. Two were spots where a violent crime had taken place. One was a spot where the emergency helicopter always lands and last was a spot on a low bridge. That's when he told me his sister had fallen from that very bridge and drowned. So this was about four or five years ago. Not too sure about the dates, but here's what happened. I went away for my parents' friend's birthday. We went to a place in Italy. I can't remember where it stopped, but we all slept in this old cottage and the owner lived next door. Everything was okay for a day. Then weird things started happening. Like I'd go to sleep, I'd close the bathroom door. Then when I wake up, it would be open slightly with the light on. It was just small stuff like that. Anyways, let's get to the day where it would get even weirder. So everything was going good this one particular day. Small things were happening in my bedroom but I thought nothing of it. We went out for the day, came back, ate, then chilled. Fast forward to the night 
I did what I did every night, then went to sleep. I closed the bathroom door and turned the light off, then fell asleep. Next thing I know, I woke up and heard a little girl's voice saying, help me. I tried getting back to sleep, but noticed the bathroom door was open slightly and the light was on. I left it like that and went back to sleep. I woke up again to the same voice saying, help me please. She sounded young, like seven years old, maybe eight. I stayed away as I couldn't get back to sleep. I was genuinely terrified. I managed to entertain myself when I heard the voice shout, Brie, continuously. I tried getting back to sleep, but couldn't. This all continued to happen, and it was 5am before I shouted for my dad. I told him everything that's happened, and he said nobody in the room, and nobody heard anything. Let me help you picture how the room was laid out. The door was on the far left side of the room. The bed was placed in the middle between the side table and the door. The bathroom door was on the right hand side of my room on the wall next to me, if that makes sense. Anyways, as the day went on, I was more and more scared and didn't want to stay in the room. Later on that day, the owner of the cottager's grandson came to visit and they had a swing outside the front. So me and the boy decided to go swing and talk. I mentioned what happened and he said when he stopped in the co that cottage once, he heard his name being called and the same situation happened to him. The rest of the time we were at the cottage, I kept away from that room and nothing more happened. I haven't been back since and now I love it as I'm fascinated with the paranormal. Also, just so nobody can say, it was probably someone playing a prank on me. It was confirmed by the owner that there's a little ghost girl in the room I slept in who says people's names, but she's completely harmless. It first happened when I was four years old. I had a very strange dream where I saw a very tall, around 6'5 creature. Its skin was pinkish brown. It had bulging eyes, red round nose, and triangular teeth in its wide mouth. The creature was smiling, and its smile reminds me of what people now call the uncanny valley, both sadistic and happy. Also, even though I don't remember it in detail, the creature seemingly had four fingers on each hand. In my dream, it tried to catch me, grabbing and carrying me somewhere. I attempted to fight it, trying to punch its face, but my fists got stuck in it, as if it was made of bubblegum. This is when I called it the man with a soft face. But that dream was not the end. It became recurring, and I saw this creature in my dreams till I was six. Sometimes it just carried me somewhere without saying anything. Sometimes it started choking me from behind. But the scariest part that made me fear this thing was its smile. Not even the feeling of total helplessness I had in these dreams. Not as disgusting to the touch, warm and sticky body in which my hands always got stuck. Its smile was the worst. Why did it always look so happy? Once, when I had this dream, this creature was carrying me somewhere at night in the middle of the street. It was snowing and I could hear its feet stepping on the snow. I know the street lights, the buildings and the creature's fates, smiling as always. Strangely enough, its eyes never expressed anything, a totally empty look. It carried me for a couple of minutes and then just stood somewhere. After a while, another creature approached. It looked similar to the man with a soft face, except its nose was long, like that of Pinocchio. The man with a soft face showed me to the creature and they started to discuss something. I don't remember what they said. I don't even remember their voices. Only the creature's lips moving as they were speaking. When I was six, these dreams stopped, but I still remember them quite vividly and they still feel scary. Has anyone else experienced something similar? I'd be glad to know if anyone else has encountered this creature in their dreams. When I was about 17 years old, I stayed at a friend's house overnight. We were up quite late, giggling and messing around in bed. 
You'd come into the house and the living room was on the left. Through a short corridor on the left was the stairs. Straight on through the corridor was a biggish room that mostly had lots of boxes and unused stuff below my friend's bedroom, which then led to a small kitchen. Her dad's room was on the right when you came up the stairs, her room was on the left, and the bathroom a longer landing leading from her bedroom, so it was directly on the left of her bedroom. The layouts helped set the scene a little. It was quite late in the night, way after midnight, and we'd all gone to bed, her dad included. I started hearing noises downstairs. The noises seemed to start directly below us in the unused room. I whispered to my friend about it who couldn't hear anything. At first it sounded like a dull thud, followed by a dragging noise, moving slowly through the room. My friend kept trying to whisper to me, as normal, but all I could focus on was the noise getting gradually closer. As soon as I heard it reach the bottom of the stairs, I started panicking, whispering to my friend about it and feeling more freaked out when she still couldn't hear it. It felt like time slowed down as the same noise moved up the stairs, thud and a long scrape. I was crying a bit quietly at that point, hoping that if I pretended to be asleep that nothing would happen. I remember feeling like it was aware of my presence even at that point. My friend was silent too and pretending to be asleep because she'd been spooked by me. We finally got to the top of the stairs and went silent as it reached and stood outside her bedroom. I was holding my breath at this point and staring into the dark, hoping it would stop. It started moving again into the bathroom and then stopped as suddenly as it had started. After that, I felt instant relief and like pressure had been lifted from the air. We went to sleep and didn't mention it again to anyone else. I slept at their house quite a lot, but never experienced anything like that again and never felt worried about being there afterwards. So this happened a long time ago. My family and I love going to garage sales and thrift stores. My parents are very friendly and polite and people like them pretty quick. So they've been offered several times to take stuff for free and even had got these types of deals. You can have everything for free, but you have to take all the stuff. So we ended up with a truck filled with random garage sale items. One time, my mum and I were in her bedroom checking the loot of one of these types of deals. We were having a good time while sorting all the stuff. We got a big trash bag that was filled with dolls. There was a lot of them. So I decided to just open the entire bag and put them all on the bed. So we started checking the dolls one by one and choosing what to keep for my sister, what to give away and what to throw away. Since most of these deals included taking some trash, but we didn't care, it was fun. We have half bags sorted out when we get to this tumbling doll that supposedly can do flips. My mum likes it. Looks like new and seems like fun toy for my sister. So she wants to keep it. Asks me to test it to see the doll tumbling, but the batteries seem to be dead. Tried again now with brand new batteries, but still no luck after a few minutes. I conclude that the doll must be broken and that it didn't work. So I take out the batteries and place the old ones back in and put the doll back on the bed. We keep sorting stuff. 15 minutes passes, my mum and I were taking a break, just chatting, when suddenly we hear this loud noise that sounded like gears in an overcharged motor. We look at the bed and the sound comes from the doll, and right in front of both of us, the doll turns its head at me and says, Mama! The movement was so abrupt that I even feel the bed shaking a little. My mum and I looked at each other and saw her face turning white. I just punched the doll as hard as I could and landed on the other side of the bedroom. We went immediately to the kitchen to calm down and explain what just happened to my dad. After a few minutes, I go back to the room with my dad to investigate, trying to find out what just happened. Then my mom enters in full rage mode, goes for the doll and put it in a plastic bag. Asks my dad to take it to the trash out of the house now. My parents are religious so after that, they were praying and blessing the entire house for almost an hour. Never seen my mum that scared. It truly felt just like a scene from a terror film. 
I expected the doll to get up and attack me at that moment. I don't really believe in paranormal stuff, even though I've had a couple of experiences that really scared me. And up to this day, I have no explanation for it, and this is one of them. Growing up, I always hated dolls and was scared of them, even to the point of having really fucked up nightmares. Good thing this happened when I was older, around 16, or I'd probably be traumatised. What still bugs me though, is that even though I find a rational explanation for why the doll worked again with dead batteries, with the power switch off and by itself, the doll wasn't a baby doll. It was a gymnastic doll that was supposed to do flips. As it wasn't new and no box, I probably will never know if this is one of the futures, and I'm okay not knowing. So it happened a few years ago, sometime in winter 2016. I randomly woke up in the middle of the night, and the first thing I noticed was how dark my room was. It was supposed to be dark as I had all my lights off and the windows closed. But you know, a little tiny bit of light from the outside street lights always find a way to enter from the edges of closed windows. Like you can barely distinguish the pitch black from a slight aura, right? But there was none of it. It was pitch black all around. I thought it was probably a power cut, and I started to think random stuff like, probably this is what blind people see all their life, it must be sad, and slowly drifted back to sleep, when I was suddenly reawoken by feeling my bed shaking. I thought I'd fallen asleep, and this is one of those sleep jerks that happen when you fall in your dream. But then, more stuff started to happen. Soon after the first shake, there was a second one which I felt much more clearly. A big rat had been invading our kitchen for a while. I thought maybe it sneaked into my room, but how can a rat shake my bed? Then a few seconds later, I felt a literal punch under my bed, as if someone punched the underside of my bed, right under where I am. I felt my bed bump up around my back. Oddly enough, instead of freaking out, I became extremely calm for some reason. And oddly enough again, I started to think of a logical reason. My mom made me check under my bed before sleeping, as she thought some thief might have sneaked in our home. She overthinks. I thought maybe someone actually sneaked in this time. But why will he disturb me instead of steam? And I felt another two consecutive punches from under me. I froze for a solid minute, finally realising things might be abnormal here. Maybe I'm bragging, but after freezing initially, I went weirdly calm again, almost as if my brain went, oh no, it's a ghost. Anyway, then was a final punch, followed by the bed shaking. I remember as the bed was shaking, I got up almost subconsciously, walked straight to the light switch on the other side of the room, and turned the lights on. Nothing out of the ordinary. I looked under my bed with a flashlight, also nothing. I should have freaked out here. But I didn't, which is odd for someone like me, who gets nervous and shaky for even the simplest social situations. My body worked almost on its own here. I turned the lights off, took the flashlight with me to bed, and fell asleep as soon as I hit the bed, and then it was morning. Nothing ever happened after that. This story goes back a while. I'm 40 now, and this takes place somewhere between the ages of 17 to 20. It was a summer night, and a few of my friends and I were hanging out, along with this girl from across the street from my friend's house, who used to vacation here during the summer at her grandfather's house. We were hanging out, staring at the stars on this large trampoline, talking about our thoughts of life, the universe, and whatever we were thinking at the moment. The girl who will remain nameless, and I really started to hit it off. We were flirting and ended up holding hands for a while. When it was time to go, I walked across the road and we were hanging out in the front yard, kissing, followed, and it started getting a little more hot and heavy. She decided we should go inside to her room, but her mom was sleeping, so we had to be quiet. The house is an old bungalow, so it's small and an odd setup. We open the exterior door that enters into the kitchen, 
and she sneaks across quickly to her room on the opposite side of the kitchen. I step in, close the door and start across the kitchen. As I'm walking slowly and I look up towards the living room to make sure her mother isn't up watching us sneak in, I freeze. She's looking at me from the doorway and says, hurry up, what are you doing? Six to eight feet from me, there's an old sofa chair and I can see an old man sitting in it with his back to me. I, without taking my eyes off him, said, there's a man sitting in the chair. Her response was, that's not funny. That was my grandfather's chair. I realized he's not moving and thought he's sleeping and then it clicked, was. I slowly look at her and say, I'm not kidding. And he's sitting right there. I'm now pointing and looking back. He's gone. Now I'm freaking out, but trying to keep my composure and stay quiet. I leap from my spot where I was frozen to the floor, right in the doorway, where she's standing, and we close the door. She's slightly upset and thinks I was messing with her. I assure her I'm not, but she doesn't believe me. But we eventually start kissing again and try to get back into it, but neither one of us can let it go. I kept saying something along the lines of, I can't believe what I just saw. She's on and off being mad that I would mess with her like that and keep saying, that's not funny. So as you would think, it didn't go much further and I ended up leaving for the night. We did hang out, out again and we did make out a couple times while we were partying, but it was never the same and went anywhere. She never would talk to me about it. I think she always has it in her head that I could be messing with her or maybe it was just freaky that he appeared to me. Apparently, he died that winter before, so it was soon after. The next winter, my friend called me. The house was on fire. They were back home in their state for the winter, and the house burned to the ground a year after him dying, with no explanation on what started the fire. I don't remember exactly how old I was, but I must have been about 10. I was with another two friends, one my age and the other one was four years older than us. We'll call them Eva and Jenny. We were in Eva's house. It was a two story house in my town. The lower ground was a long garage that could fit several cars and the first floor was the actual house. To get in the garage, there was a door on the left side of the staircase. She had her play area at the end of the garage opposite the entrance and about three to four meters from where her toys were. There was a storage room where Eva's parents would keep her winter clothes, costumes and the like. I was very used to her house as she would celebrate her birthdays in that garage and I visited often. We must have been playing for a while when we swapped games and opened a dollhouse. I must say that there was no creepy talk at all, just three girls playing with the doll family. A bit later, I started feeling something in that storage room I mentioned. I remember this moment crystal clear, but I'm not sure I can explain what I felt. I've never experienced anything like that again. There was just something not nice in that room and I just didn't want to be there at all. I didn't see or hear anything, but had a very strange feeling towards that door. I'm not sure if it was something evil I felt or if it was just a strange feeling. And because I was a kid, I didn't understand exactly what it was, but it was emanating from that room. It felt like the door was going to open wide by itself. The joyful playing stopped and the three of us went a bit quiet until we realized we all were feeling the same, unprompted and without any prior talk. We shared what we were feeling and started moving in the opposite direction from our storage room. The three of us were scared. Eva and I tried to get Jenny to check it out because of course, she was the oldest, but she completely refused. We ended up rushing to tidy up the toys so we wouldn't get in trouble and sprinted towards the door to leave and go upstairs. We were pushing each other a bit to not be the last left in the garage, but I ended up being the last one. The light switch for the garage was on the right hand side by the door. So Eva went first and opened the door. Then Jenny, and when it was my turn, I slapped the light switch off and we went upstairs in complete darkness of just how scared we were that we didn't even turn on the light of the staircase. Fast forward a couple of hours later, we were in Eva's bedroom, back to play, and the feeling went away as we felt safe again. 
Eva's mum came home from work and went to check up on us. She asked why we left the light on in the garage, because she just parked and all of them were on. Now, I'm 100% I turned them off. We crawled the stairs in complete darkness after all, so how the lights were turned on is a complete mystery. Unfortunately, I haven't kept in contact with Eva and Jenny, so I can't ask if they remember this experience. But my memories from my childhood are very vivid, and this one particularly has always been there. I've never felt or experienced anything like that again, so any inputs are most welcome. My father is a policeman, a no-nonsense guy, who lives very much in the here and now and believes only in what he can see and feel or hear himself. At the time of this story, he was in the police force for more than 20 years and I was a teenager. My father worked night shifts and on a regular basis, he would come home in the early morning to have breakfast with us before he would go to bed and we would go to school. He would usually be in a good mood and tell us funny or interesting stories from his day or nights at work. This morning, he was unusually silent and he didn't eat either. My mother asked if he felt all right. It took him a while to actually answer and he said, I'm not sure what I experienced tonight. He didn't want to say any more in front of us kids, but we prodded him long enough until he told us the following. It had been a quiet night and he was out with his colleague in a police car. At some point, they were informed over the radio that a car chase was going on not far from them and their assistance was required. They drove off towards the chase and soon caught up with the suspect's vehicle. The radio had informed them that two men were in the front of the car. My father's car pulled up almost beside the car so that he managed to get a good look into the inside. He saw the two men in the front arguing heatedly with each other and he saw another man in the back. He had no hair and was so pale that he seemed almost white. He was dressed in all black and he looked directly at my father, his face almost pressed against the window, with very dark eyes and he grinned widely. My father was deeply unsettled by this person. He seemed to look directly into my father's eyes. My father was so sure of this third person that he informed the other police cars about him. The chase ended with the car crashing into a fence and the suspects fleeing into a field. They were apprehended only minutes later. There were two men, not three. My father asked all his colleagues at the scene if they were sure there hadn't been another guy. Nobody else had seen the third man. I can't explain it, he said to us. I saw him as clear as day and he grinned at me like death himself. This took place in 2004 or 5 in Germany. To this day, we have no logical explanation for what he really saw and experienced. This event happened to me last summer. First of all, I'd like to say I am more of a man of science and a man of faith, even though a few strange things have happened to me in my life that I've not been able to rationally explain. It was the beginning of August and nothing special was happening in my life. I had a period of depression, but it was no strange to me. I've had it since I was a child and it always passed. I have dreams almost every day and this night was no exception. But this time, it was completely different. I had a nightmare in which there was a tall, pale woman with black eyes and black hair. She looked almost human, but there was something inhuman about her. I guess I can't fully describe what it was. It was just my feeling. She looked very nice to me, and her voice sounded sweet as she spoke to me. But even in that dream, I knew that her intentions with me were not good. I don't remember her words. All I know is that the expression on her face gradually changed and she was mad at me. I woke up sweaty and my heart was pounding. I've never had a similar nightmare that would have had such an effect on my body, but that wasn't all. My thoughts were hazy and one thought resonated in my head. Kill yourself and you will be fine. Kill yourself and it will all end. It will be okay again. You do not belong here. 
I've never thought of hurting myself in my life. I love life and I love people. Like, it wasn't even me. I got out of bed and went to the kitchen where I drank a glass of cold water and the thought slowly faded from me. I was a little shaken, but I still thought it was just a very bad nightmare. So I went back to bed and fell asleep again. Nothing more happened that night. I woke up in the morning before my girlfriend, which I thought was pretty weird because she's the morning person in our household. She looked very tired when she came to the kitchen. I asked her if she was okay, and then she replied that she just had a very strange dream. I told her to tell me the details. In her dream, we were in our bedroom. My girlfriend was awake in the dream, but I was asleep. A strange woman was sitting on the edge of the bed. She looked at her and then pointed at me. She told her, you have to help me kill him. He's worried here. He doesn't belong here. If you help me, he'll be happy again. You want him to be happy, don't you? My girlfriend started arguing with that strange woman. The quarrel led nowhere and the woman attacked her. My girlfriend fought the strange figure, tugging at her hair and scratching her face. She said she felt she was really hurting her because the woman had disappeared with a scream. At that moment, I was staring at my girlfriend in disbelief and asked her one more thing, even though I knew what she would answer. I asked her what the woman looked like. You guessed it right. Tall, black hair, fair skin and big black eyes. She says she'll never forget how she grinned at her. I realised one more thing that morning. My depression was over. I felt as if someone had lifted a heavy stone off my chest and I could breathe freely again. Nothing like this has happened to me since. I'd love to know what those dreams meant. So take it back about three years. I had just finished my workout for football. I'm happy heading home to relax for the rest of that Saturday. My family was out of town for the weekend, so I was home alone. I proceeded to make food and watch TV in the living room. Keep in mind, it's about one in the afternoon. And I just got an odd vibe. Not really sure how to explain it, but as if I had a perception to know something was of danger. 30 minutes go by and I can't seem to shake the feeling. So I decide that I'll watch Netflix till I fall asleep. I don't remember falling asleep, but I wake up with my eyes closed and proceed to stretch my body from being sore. I sit up on the couch, wipe the crust from my eyes and look to see if the television was still running. I notice it was still light outside, but there was a dark thing in my vision and I try to readjust and finally realise that there is a shadow of a man standing there facing me. My mind feels as if it's being fried with the information it's processing, with what I'm seeing as I sit there dazed and confused. The shadow was in the shape of a man and it was about eight to nine feet tall. The shadow lowers its hand down to me in a gesture and leaves it out there outstretched. There were no words that were spoken, but in my head, I could just feel that the meaning was to take the hand. At this point, I'm beyond scared because I think I'm going to die. I have no idea what to do or even what to think. So in desperation, I close my eyes and go into prayer and ask God to just let it be quick. If this is how I go, please let it be fast. And about as quick as I was rattling it off over in my head, the vibe or feeling I had that was unsettling went away. And I opened my eyes and the shadow with his outstretched hand wasn't there anymore. This was pretty long, but I had to get the whole scenario down so I could get some help in what I actually experienced. I know the argument of sleep paralysis is going to be made. And what I have to say is that I stretched and sat up. I wanted to assume it was sleep paralysis as well. I didn't know how long it was for this to all take place, but it felt like hours and the presence of the shadow wasn't anything I've experienced in my life. So I like to explore abandoned places. Me and a friend were walking through the woods of Virginia to find an old mine shaft. It was about 8 p.m. last Saturday. So as we're walking, all the animals would go completely silent randomly. 
and shortly after we'd find a bunch of flat stones stacked on top of each other, along with branches cracking and rustling in the woods. This happened probably about four times. Further in the woods, it became completely silent and stayed that way. So during this walk, we're looking around when my friend spots these red eyes in the distance, about group height. We stopped for a bit and just stared at it till we got bored and continued our walk. We soon spotted them again, but this time waist high, so we ignored it and continued on. Once again, we came across the eyes, but this time they were closer and about five feet tall, leaned slightly to the left behind a tree. I should mention that we forgot our flashlights and did this whole thing with the lights on our phones. Our light source didn't really go out very far, but we sat there looking at this thing for what felt like an hour. We could see it blink and look around, but it never moved. Occasionally, we'd get the smell of rotted fish. At this point, we said, fuck the mine, we need to leave. I knew there was an old road not far from where we were, so we headed towards it. But we came across what I think was a coyote. Big ass looking dog thing. So we debated if we could walk around it, but by the time we decided and realized it, we had become surrounded. We had six of these animals around us in every direction, except directly behind us. In that instant, we looked at each other, pulled out our book knives, thinking we'd rather die fighting. But the coyotes never approached us. They just stood in front of us. So he suggested we walk back towards till they left us alone. As we walked backwards, the coyotes followed us. But if we started to go to the left or right, they would kind of jump at us. We made it out safely, but looking back now, it's been almost a week since this happened. I kind of feel like the coyotes were guiding us to safety from whatever that thing with red eyes was, but I'm no quitter. Me and my friend will be going back to those woods again as soon as I get a weekend off. I need to know what those red eyes were and I really want to explore that mine. Have you guys got any idea on what that thing has red eyes? Let me know. This story happened about eight years ago, and it still pops into my head from time to time, so I thought I'd share it here. If you've experienced anything similar to what I'm about to tell you, please let me know. So it was 2013, and little 12-year-old me was laying in bed. It was probably about 10pm. I'm assuming because that's when I usually went to sleep. I was laying on my side facing a wall, and I heard walking that sounded fairly close to me. I thought nothing of it because I thought that maybe it was my sister or something going to use the bathroom. From what I can remember, the walking was very slow paced, which I thought was weird. The walking then stopped, but I didn't hear the door open for the bathroom. And I know I would have heard it because it's just across from my bedroom. After a while of facing the wall, I decided to turn onto my other side, which would mean I would now be facing my open room. When I flipped over, I gasped and froze. I couldn't move at all, and I was holding my breath. I'll never forget what I saw. It was a tall man dressed in a long black coat with a big hat on. The man was very tall, and I know this may sound odd, but he was darker than the pitch black darkness that swallowed my room. He was standing in the farthest corner in my, my room, just staring at me. He didn't move whatsoever, and neither did I. I don't know for how long I was frozen staring at him, holding my breath for. It could have only been a minute, but it felt like forever. I can't describe the terror that came over me when I saw him standing there. I can't even remember what I was thinking at the time. Then I woke up in the morning. I don't even remember falling asleep or exhaling, I just woke up. Now some of you may be thinking, that was all probably a dream. Maybe even sleep paralysis. I would think that too, had it not been for the two large footprints in the carpet, right where I saw him standing the night before. I did take a picture of the footprints, but sadly the picture is gone. I've looked for it everywhere and I just can't find it, so you'll just have to take my word for it. I told my sister about what I had experienced the next morning and she said, have you ever heard of the hat man? I said no, and she explained to me who he was. After researching a bit, 
I found that there are a few people who have also seen this man, and they also say he doesn't do anything but stare at them. It's been eight years and I haven't seen him since. Maybe it was all my imagination, but it felt so real. I refused to sleep in my room for years after that because I was afraid I'd see him again. Luckily I never do, and I hope I never do. I live with seven other people. Four of us reside upstairs and four of us downstairs. The downstairs entrance is at the back of the house, so I didn't really see much of the inhabitants. This particular night, my parents and sister weren't at home. The people downstairs were home, but everyone locked up after 8pm. I did the same and decided to get an early night's rest. Around 1.30am, I heard a loud banging sound coming from the front door. Thinking it was my family finally home, I tried to get up, but there was a heavy, invisible weight on me that prevented me from doing so. Also, my family had a key they could have opened the door easily, and usually, even in my sleep, I hear the front gate opening, but I didn't hear it unlock or even open. Strange. I eventually got up, and it was as if something possessed me to pick up my cell phone. I hurriedly made it to the front door, which was not too far from my room. The banging was loud now that I was closer and the door was shaking. Then something made me stop. My parents would call my name no matter what when they came home and they wouldn't violently bang on my door like that. I quietly went to the room nearest to the front door and peeped out the window. The banging was still occurring but there was no one at the door. Then at that moment my phone rang. I answered and a man with a gruff voice said open the door. At this point, I was terrified. Obviously, I didn't open the door. I texted the number and even tried to call back, but each time I called, there was static on the other side. I don't know how I managed to sleep that night, but when I woke up, I immediately told my family about the incident. They tried dialing the number as well, but again, static. Later that day, I found out that the number was out of service and had been so for the past 20 years. It was definitely one of the scariest experiences I've ever had. When I was younger, my parents had gotten divorced. My dad was an abusive alcoholic who drained my mom out of a lot of money. So my mom and I left and at the time, my aunt offered to let us stay at her house until we got back on our feet. Now my aunt lives in a rural part of the country. It's miles of farmland and a few houses every now and then. Her neighbourhood is small, but everyone keeps to themselves. The area my aunt lives is called the base. Apparently, soldiers were housed there and eventually died and were buried in those lands. Don't know the exact history though. Driving to her place at night is super creepy and confusing. You can easily get lost. So everyone aims to reach home before the sun sets. Now, back to my story. My aunt had a second house not too far, where her family would go to do gardening and just chill sometimes. So my cousins and my aunt thought it would be a great idea to spend a night there. The house was an old abandoned Baptist church converted to a house that my aunt inherited. The previous owner was a seal woman and would do readings and even exorcisms for people. My aunt took care of her when she was ill, so she gave the house to my aunt. The inside was run down. One couch for about ten of us, yeah, big family, and a dirty bathroom with an annoying leaky pipe. Light barely entered the house during the day. It also gave an eerie vibe to it, because in that house or land, it was always dead silent, despite being surrounded by nature. That night, we had all these little rooms to sleep in, so being so much of us, we had to share. My mum and I were in one room when I woke up to the sound of the wooden door being creaked open. I turned to see my mother upright, shaking, obviously full of fear. No one came through the door, but you could hear these loud, heavy footsteps around and inside the house. It woke everyone, so we all huddled in the living room. All of a sudden, the lights cut off. 
We lit some lamps and my uncle was getting ready to check on the noise outside when a loud banging came at the front door. It was around 1am and this place is almost deserted. We all stood still and quiet and then the banging got even more violent. The door began to shake and a guttural demonic voice was asking to be let in. Panic and terror struck all of us. My younger cousins began to scream and cry because the voice was unnatural, pure evil. The adults sent us into one room and they formed a prayer circle in the middle of the living room. Everyone's backs were turned to the window, but I was the only one facing it and I remember very clearly seeing a tall man with horns and a red aura looking back at me from outside and he was smiling at me, motioning me to come towards him. He had these long black fingernails that he began scraping the window with. At this point, everyone could hear it, but by the time they turned to the window, he'd vanished. However, all the doors started banging and the windows were rattling. We kids all ran out of the living room and joined the prayer circle reciting the mantras from my religion, then suddenly it stopped. The sun was now peaking. It was 6am. Everything felt like an hour, but we couldn't re account for the rest of the time that had gone. We stayed for a few months in my aunt's original house without ever visiting that second house. My mom eventually got remarried, so we moved. It's been about 17 years or so since that incident, and we rarely visit my aunt. Like, once or twice a year. Since then, however, the house has been demolished. My aunt has said strange things occurred whenever she was on that land after that incident and she felt like she was being watched. She couldn't handle it and they eventually sold the land too. Currently, there are no residents on that land. In 2016, my aunt had an event and the entire family was heading there. My mom tried to convince me to go, since my aunt lived quite a far distance from where we lived, and it made her uneasy, knowing I'd be home alone and they wouldn't get back till late. However, I chose to stay home because at the time I had my A-level exams, and I was glad to get some alone time to study in peace and quiet. It was about 6pm when my family left. I locked the doors and decided to take a nap before I started studying. I was in the living room on the couch for about 15 minutes when the air suddenly became stuffy. I sat up and looked around. There was something different. The lights looked dimmer. There was a slight cloudy look and the three fans, including the ceiling fan I had on, just stopped working at the same moment, which was strange. Despite the place being really warm all day, I also noticed a huge drop in temperature. As I was about to get up, I started feeling this heavy pressure surrounding me and eventually it was on top of me. It weighed down on me and immediately I was engulfed by feelings of sadness and depression. I started to cry uncontrollably and I began hearing faint whispers. I closed my eyes during this episode but when I opened them I saw I had a razor blade to my wrist. It had only been about five minutes. I know I hadn't moved and there were no razor blades lying around to say it was easily accessible. I tried pulling the razor away, but it felt as though there was a force going against me, pushing it closer to my wrist. I literally had to struggle to pull it away. As soon as I managed to get it away from me, I felt the pressure in the room increase. I felt a gripping fear and was compelled to run out the house. I threw on some decent clothes and bolted out the house. I called my parents to come get me. I locked the door and was waiting outside when the door began to shake violently as if someone was trying to come out and it was accompanied by loud banging sounds. I saw my neighbours outside at this point and decided to stay in their view until my parents arrived. When they did reach, my mom, who's usually sensitive, felt the sudden drop of temperature and her hair stood on end. My stepdad, who's a pundit, Hindu equivalent to a pastor, performed a quick fire ritual and smoked the house out. Thankfully, I haven't experienced anything like that since then.
La Diablesse slash La Hablesse is a character in Caribbean folklore. It's a human woman usually having an attractive body and clothing, but a hideous face which she keeps hidden. She has one human foot and one cow hoof. She lures males into the forest so that they get lost and can never find their way back. So they end up dying either by getting eaten by a wild animal or by some other gruesome means. This happened in Trinidad in the 80s. My uncle was living in the house I live in presently, my grandfather's house that my mother inherited. In those days, it was my grandparents and their eight children. My uncle was the one of the older siblings and would work late night shifts so he could return home between the hours of 11 and 1 a.m. Now my street wasn't as developed as it is now. There was a lot of bush and forested area with a few houses scattered in between. My house is about a quarter mile in and the road wasn't paved in that time. It was more of a track than a road. So one night when my uncle returned home from one of his night shifts, he saw in the distance a woman walking down the street. From the look of her clothing, he assumed it was my senile great grandmother. She had a few instances where she would wander off and reach far places. So initially my uncle thought it was her. He saw her familiar dress and the white shawl she always had draped over her head, and he would make out pieces of the tattoos she had on her arms. Now he thought it was strange. It was the latest he ever saw her outside, and her house was at least ten minutes away from ours. He called out to her a couple times, but she didn't turn around. She kept walking. At this time, my uncle decided to follow her and get back to her home. As he neared her, he realized something really weird. He kept calling out to her and yet she didn't turn around. When he looked down, he saw that my great grandmother had a cow hoof where her left foot should have been. He was really close to her now and when he noticed it, the woman stopped dead in her tracks. My uncle in sheer terror turned around and said he never ran so fast in his entire life. He raced on home and since that incident, he always had my grandfather wait for him until he eventually left that job. So I'm from Trinidad and Tobago, located in the Caribbean. According to our folklore, a doing is the spirit of a child who died before baptism. They have no faces except an O-shaped mouth, feet turned backwards and a large hat. They usually lure children into the woods so as to make them lost and die. They also tend to be present at rivers and bamboo patches. Growing up, my grandparents and elder relatives would always warn me about them, considering I live near a forested area and there's a river right by my house. They used to say, if Duans heard someone call your name, they can take on the voices of those persons and use it to lure you in. I usually ignored their warning and would play close to the river by myself because I was an only child back then. One evening, when I was about 10, I was in my hammock on the patio. Note, I had a clear view of the river and bamboo patch from where I was. It was around 4pm when I realised the atmosphere suddenly turned eerie. The wind stopped blowing, the trees were still as fuck, not a sound could be heard from any animals. The street I live in became too quiet and it was like I was frozen in time. While rocking in the hammock, I heard my mom suddenly call my name. It was as if she was shouting and she kept calling for like two minutes straight until I shouted back, all right, I'm coming. Now this is where it gets weird. All the time she was calling, it was coming from the direction of the bamboo patch across the river. I was confused as to why my mom would be there, but my gut told me to check inside the house first. Walking through the house, I could still hear her calling me until I reached the back room and found my mom doing laundry. I asked if she was calling and she said she never called me. I looked out the back door and the calling stopped. I asked my mom if she heard someone calling my name and she said she heard nothing. Since then, I stopped playing outside and I never heard my name called again.
I was a mess. Wanted to die too. And just full of sadness day and night. That's when I dreamt with him the first time. Told him I missed him. And he told me he missed me too. Then he told me he was pissed because his mom and aunt started giving away his stuff. Then told me he wanted me to keep his drum set. He was a drummer. But I told him, told him I didn't want it. But could keep a hoodie or something. He told me he wanted no one to keep his drums. And I said, sorry. I had no space to keep a drum set. Next day, I went to his house and his mom told me she wanted me to keep his drums. Told her the same. Grabbed a hoodie and she told me he doesn't want anybody else to have this, you know. I was weirded out but left. Next day, the house was robbed and they just took the drum set, a PlayStation and some food. Weird. Then he came back a couple of times just to walk and talk. And one of those times, he told me his mom and aunt were all creepy, logging to his Facebook and MySpace accounts, and he was pissed again. I laughed and told him, well, maybe it's their way of dealing with all of this. He told me he didn't care, but wanted me to change the passwords. I laughed again and told him I wasn't going to do this, but insisted and gave me the passwords and told me what password he wanted both accounts to have. It was just random numbers and letters. Days passed and I haven't dreamed about him on maybe one week or two. Funny thing is, I remembered the password. I'm easily distracted and forget things in a matter of seconds. So I decided to do it. I changed the passwords to see if with this, he would come back to my dreams. I logged in and changed the passwords on the random numbers and letters he provided. And just as I clicked save or whatever, I forgot those passwords. Days later, I went to his house and his mom told me someone changed his password. I felt really weird but said nothing. Last dream I had, we were laughing and talking. He told me he wanted me to come with him somewhere. It was a funeral. I asked him who the funeral was for. He just responded, you'll see. As we arrived, asked me to come to the coffin. I went and saw. And as I looked down, I realized it was me. At that exact moment, I woke up and was really scared. I don't remember how many time passed, maybe three or four days, maybe a week. I received a call from his aunt to let me know his mom committed suicide. I was really sad as she was an awesome person, but she fell into depression. Her mom was recently deceased and now her only son. started a few months ago. I want to say November, but I'm not sure. I'm a theatre student at a small school in a smaller town, but it has a lot of misery. Most notably, the college I go to is very old and was used as a civil war hospital way back in the day, but that's beside the point. In November, my teacher had the idea to make some monologue based on some of the people who have passed in our small town. The role I was given was a soldier, confederate. His name was Abraham Gurgenus. The monologue was with a friend of mine, and we were playing these characters in a funny way. Abraham was mad that he didn't die in battle, and he was complaining about it. Him and several others died of smallpox. It was funny, but never sat right with me. That wasn't the weird part, though. One day, me and my girlfriend were bored and decided to go to the graveyard and find Abraham's grave, figure out more about him and do some field research for the show. We get there, and we go over to where the Civil War graves are, and I found him. His grave was renovated and looked considerably nicer than the others. I found out that he was a private, which meant he was no older than me, maybe even just as old as I am, 19. But I also realized that he died on Christmas Day, which is awful. But I kneeled down, put some flowers down, and just said something like, I respect you, even though I'm playing you in a humor-like tone. I did it because why not? And ever since that day, strange things have been happening. The first time I knew something was off was when I was driving with my girlfriend. It was late and we were just driving and talking. But I make a turn and see a man standing in the middle of the road. He was black, as if his whole body was black, like a shadow man. 
I looked at him, blinked, and he was gone. And I just knew it was Abraham, like I sensed his presence. But the strange part is that my girlfriend bursted into tears, out of nowhere. She said it was an overwhelming feeling, and she just felt so upset and hurt. And it's gotten bigger from there. Now, the weird part is that he's not hurting me. Whenever I see him, I don't feel scared or in danger. I feel safe and calm, like he's my protector. And another thing is that our college is notoriously haunted. But all the spirits I've seen have been white, like a standard spirit, but Abraham is black. I just wanted to share this and get other opinions. Again, I can't stress this enough. He doesn't want to hurt me, or he doesn't feel like he wants to. I just want to know why he's here, I guess. One Sunday, about last year, my friend Jake and I wanted to do something fun and interesting. So we thought about doing a Ouija board. I got a sturdy piece of cardboard and Jake put the Ouija letters on it. We both thought it would be super fun or something. We knew about the stories of how they stay in your home forever if you invite them. And so we went to a park away from our neighborhood and set it up there. My friend told me we had to allow the spirits to control us in order to have it work. That sort of scared me. First, we would ask, are there any spirits who would like to talk with us? We asked that about 15 times. It started to seem hopeless. Let's just do it one more time, and then we should just go home, I said. We asked again, are there any spirits who would like to talk with us? And then Jake moved the circle thing onto the yes. Jake flipped out. I thought he was just being dumb because he didn't want to go back home. I was convinced that he moved it. Dude, that's not funny at all. Stop moving it, I told him. He looked at me with a serious face and said, I didn't move. I thought you did. That's when I started to feel spooked, but it wasn't enough to get me away from there. Okay, then I'll ask something only I know, I said. I thought about my room. I had an old steel black iPod touch at the bottom of my desk drawer, and I knew Jake didn't know about that. So I asked, what's in my bottom desk drawer at my house? And we spun the circle around on the board. It started to spell out. I. P. O. I took my hands away and yelled, Jake, did you go through my stuff? He just looked at me in disbelief. You are pranking me, aren't you? He asked. That's when I realized this whole thing was real. We're talking to a spirit, Jake realized. Then we asked it a bunch of stupid questions, stuff like, what am I thinking? It would tell us correctly every time. We asked it its name and it said, John. Then we asked, are you a peaceful spirit? It said, no. Do you want to hurt us? The circle slowly moved to yes. Holy frick, man, Jake said. I don't want to do this anymore. Jake stood up. I was glad he said that because I felt the same. We tossed the board into a gated area and ran back to my house. On the way, we passed a person walking their dog. The dog barked at us like crazy. I've never seen a dog barking so badly. That night, I couldn't sleep. I kept thinking about that spirit. I thought it was in my room. I don't know if I thought about the spirit enough to make myself feel it in my home, or if it was actually there. It was only a hint of a presence I could feel. So it was unclear. A week later, I couldn't feel it anymore. And to this day, I haven't felt it again. Don't mess with Ouija boards unless you want to screw up your life. We must have gotten lucky. When I was in the sixth grade, around 12 weeks in of school, my family and I moved in with my aunt, my mom's sister only because my parents were going to invest in starting their own business. So this led to spending as little as possible and saving more. Things didn't work out between my parents and it led to a divorce. My mom got her own place and my dad was still renting a room for my aunt's apartment. I'd been living with my aunt until I graduated from middle school and was just about to enter high school until both my dad and aunt moved out and went our own way. 
This encounter occurred somewhere around 2014, 15. I was around 13 or 14. I'm just estimating, since I don't quite remember the exact year and grade I was in at the time. Moving along, it was a weekend, morning, and my aunt and her family were on their way to church. I decided to stay home and not go with them, since I always found church boring. No offence. We'll be back later around evening, my aunt said. As soon as they left, I put on Netflix, relaxed, eating some chips, with no worries in the world. I was watching Malcolm in the Middle, and I had my cousin's dog next to me on the couch sleeping. Eventually, a few episodes throughout the show, the dog decided to go into my cousin's room and sleep on his bed. As a habit, doors would always stay open from our rooms. A few hours go by as I'm watching the show, laughing, when suddenly my door slams shut. I assumed it was the air coming in from the window, but the odd thing was, I had my windows closed, so there was no way of the air coming in other than from the living room windows. I ignored it and said to myself, maybe I did leave the windows open, doubting myself. Shortly after, my cousin's dog starts barking for a quick five seconds and stops. A white ladylike figure appeared behind the wall from the hall of our rooms. It was visible, even though I was looking at it from the corner of my eyes. I ignored it and immediately thought I was just tripping balls. Its head was becoming more visible as it was peeking. Skin was white as paint with large black eyes and really long wet hair. I turned to look at it and it hid. I went back to watching the show and once again it peeks once more. This time its hands were grasping onto the wall and it showed its face up to its nose. Hands so white, fingers long and clear. At this point I looked back towards it again hoping it would just leave me alone. It hid. I immediately opened the front door and called my mom, letting her know what happened. She was so confused and told me it was because I behaved poorly. She offered to pick me up and go to her house, but I decided to stay. I kept the front door open to feel some sort of security. My aunt and her family arrived around 6pm. I was afraid to tell my aunt what happened, because I thought she would just laugh at me, but instead, she asked questions and was open to the whole situation. I've seen it too, she said. She explained to me that she's heard footsteps and seen the figure staring at her from the kitchen, when she would sleep in the living room quite a few times, and always in the early in the morning, around 2-3am. to 3 a.m. As she explained to me her encounters, I felt comforted. I knew I wasn't crazy, and wasn't just seeing things. When we moved out, we found out an old lady had died there. Maybe that explains this mysterious figure or demon? I've had numerous encounters with these types of figures in the past as a little kid. But to this day, this one has been the most recent one that has happened to me and second to scariest. Let me know what your thoughts on this situation. This is a story from several years ago, staying at a cheap hotel in New England while visiting family. Before I begin, it's important to know that I'm not prone to nightmares, and generally pretty sceptical about occurrences that are out of the ordinary. The hotel room was closer to an apartment in some ways, with a full kitchen and a couple chairs arranged in some attempt at a sitting room. It wasn't exactly clean, the floor tiles were sticky, and the windows sat streaked with grime. One large stain in the carpet was the colour of dried blood. Murder hotel, we kept calling it, but really, we didn't care. We were 15 and ecstatic to have a space away from our parents. After spending the day with family, we settled into the queen beds along the far wall of the room. There was no overhead light, and I remember how different the room looked in the glow of the sickly yellow lamps. Chills ran down my legs when I returned my back to the kitchen, but I didn't think much of it. I was a paranoid kid who read scary stories in the daytime, but still slept with a nightlight. I decided that I wasn't chicken, and that there was nothing to do but ignore the feeling. After tossing and turning a little, I fell asleep, reassured by the sound of my sister snoring from the other bed. I was standing in the parking lot of my hometown shopping centre, alone, except for a single figure in front of me. 
Whatever it was took the shape of a man. He was middle-aged, greasy brown hair hanging loosely around shoulders padded with flannel. Patches of grey flooded his poorly kept beard. His clothes were expensive, clean and crisp, as though tailored for a special occasion. But the presence wasn't human. He felt hollow. Like under that skin there was a cavity of slime and rot, and the darkness that lives in the space between the stars. The man turned to enter the building behind him, but before he could, dozens of creatures sprang out of the shadows, sinking jaws into flesh and tearing claws into iron clothes. I think they were dogs, black dogs, with an intelligence burning behind bright red eyes. They tore his body apart, snuffing out the darkness with the orange streetlights behind them. My stomach turned as I watched, and I felt hot blood splash across my face. The man cried out with an inhuman scream. Organs collapsed into messes of purple and red, and skin sloughed away like wet paper. I wasn't able to look away. I woke up in the chalky darkness of the hour before dawn. I clung to the sheets, kicking my legs, trying to shift myself away from the lull of sleep. The air in the room was heavy and cold, just as it had been in my dream. It felt like something wasn't right, so I buried my head in the sheets and waited until morning. We stayed at the hotel for two more nights. Each time I closed my eyes, it was the same man, standing outside a familiar place. Each time, the dogs were there, waiting to tear him limb from limb. I began to dread sleeping, but even the dream seemed safer than the alternative of lying awake. As we packed on the last morning of our stay, my sister mentioned she had been having nightmares as well. She doesn't remember as much as I do, but she was equally terrified. There were no dogs in her dream, but there was a man. The exact same man. I don't know who lived in that hotel room before us, or what they may have been lurking in the dark. It's possible that something terrible happened there, or that I gave myself a bad dream and simply missed my own bed. I think if the man had been allowed to go inside the buildings, we wouldn't have been safe. I haven't seen or heard from either of the entities in the dream since. I think I can live with that. This happened a couple years ago, when I was working at my childhood summer camp. I've certainly gotten strange feelings around the area before, but nothing especially malevolent or frightening. My coworker and I were taking our group for a sleep out, up in some shelters about half a mile into the woods and away from the rest of camp. I'm used to being in the woods and I generally don't scare easily, even at night. So when I woke up in the wee hours of the morning, I set out for the Lantrines with a second thought. I figured it was around 4 or 5 a.m., based on a red glow on the horizon. The light fell softly through the trees, illuminating the path and the colour sides of the shelters. The walk was only a few hundred yards. It felt longer with only my flashlight. I was about halfway there before I heard something behind me. Again, I know those woods. I know what most of the animals in the area sound like, from the camp's horses to the local family of black bears. Whatever this was, it was huge. Its presence seemed to close in on me from all around, and I could hear twigs snapping, vines tearing, mud squelching underfoot. I'm not fast, and I knew that running on the uneven path in the dark wouldn't get me far. So I walked. I walked like I owned those woods, slowly and deliberately, until I reached the light on the side of the latrine. The presence had faded. I was even starting to feel good confident, like I could keep going, keep walking through the dark woods until I reached the sunrise. I had to tell myself to stop, to turn where I meant to turn. I eventually returned to my shelter and fell asleep. Maybe I would have forgotten about it all if not for that sunrise. I've watched so many sunrises over the lake, I should have known better. That red light in the woods wasn't in the east where it should have been. It was out by the western side of the pasture blood red and a little too bright for what it was pretending to be. The more I thought about it, the more it felt like I was being herded somewhere. I haven't met anyone with a similar experience, but my friends have theories from fairies to alien abduction. I'm not sure I believe that, 
but I'll never go to that part of the woods alone again. In December 2018, I got a message from my stepdad that my nan had been taken to hospital with pneumonia. The second I read the message, I called him to ask what was going on. He told me she'd been in a few days and she wasn't doing too well. I immediately got myself showered and dressed, then went straight to the hospital to see her. When I got to the hospital, I went straight up to her room and saw her lying there, and it broke me, more than I've been broken before. She looked terrible, thin, weak, barely holding on. I broke down and had to leave the room as she was still somewhat conscious of what was going on. She even thought that she was going home that day. My mum and stepdad were there looking after her and trying to do what they could to help her. I spent a few hours there talking to her, but she couldn't really respond back. It's important for later. But I think she did say that she needed the toilet. Of course, she could go to the toilet when she liked, given the situation. I head home later and head to bed. I wake up the next morning and tell my parents I'll take over watching her so they can go home and sleep. I don't remember what time I get there, but my uncle is there and it's late at night. Something like 10pm, he says, and chats for a bit and then leaves. I thought at least. After he leaves, I just look at my nan and wish I could talk to her and tell her things I wanted her to know. Not sure if she could hear me, I tell her anyway. I turn away briefly and check my phone and there's something missing in the room. I don't hear my nan's breathing anymore. I start crying again. I love my nan greatly and I wait till she passes on. Call my uncle and tell him. He comes back because he's not too far away as he'd not long left. It had been like an hour since I saw him last. By this point, we told the nurse and she said we have to wait as the doctor was busy. A bit of time passes by and the doctor comes in to declare her death, etc. And we get told to wait outside the room, so we leave and wait. While waiting, I'm talking to my uncle and partner. The partner has been with me the whole time. And we see someone walk by us and head to the toilet outside my nan's room. They close the door and the light comes on. A few minutes go by, the door is open slightly and no one comes out. And the light goes out. I go to check and well, there was no one there. We all look at each other confused as heck as we all saw the exact same thing. So my nan decided she needed the toilet before going on to what waits her next. I'd say around 2004, a friend of mine decided to move out of the Seminole Indian Reservation and bought a house in a town called Naples, Florida off of DeSoto Boulevard. At the time, this road was a narrow dirt road and only a few homes off said road. Middle of nowhere and deep into the woods. Beautiful home, just very secluded. He decided to have a housewarming party which lasted well into the next morning. I was the guy that got to the party first and was usually the last to leave. I'd say there were about 20 of us. I was spent and decided to leave around 3am or so. So I said my goodbyes and took off, starting my journey down this dirt road. Mind you, no street lamps and you're literally in the middle of the bush. At the time I was really into cars and one of my favourite upgrades was my audio system. Highs, lows and mids, thousands of dollars worth of audio equipment. Young and dumb. Anyway, I'm driving down this road at about 30 miles per hour. Windows down and music annoyingly loud. I got about to the halfway point of my little journey when I felt a slight push against my seat, almost as if a small child kicked the back of the seat. Didn't think of anything of it. I mean, it is a dirt road and I do have two 15-inch subwoofers in my trunk. So I lit up a smoke and turned down the radio. I started to feel a bit uneasy. That funny feeling when someone is staring at you, but given my surroundings, it was understandable. So I just kept convincing myself that it's nothing to worry about and to just keep driving. After about five minutes, I felt another slight push against my seat. At this point, I decided to slow down and look into my rear view mirror. Nothing but a giant cloud of dust with the red 
from my tail lights reflecting off the dust. I decided to take a quick look into my back seat, and what I saw will never leave my mind, and I will never forget. It was a white face, no eyes and the mouth slightly open. I slammed on my brakes and jumped out of my car. Now picture yourself in my shoes, on the dirt road, alone, and just witnessing something in your back seat. And the only light is coming from the very thing that you're supposed to feel safe in. I'm panicking at this point. Smokes, cell phones are in the car. After about 10 minutes outside of my car trying to collect myself, I decided to approach the car. And of course, nothing was in the back seat. So cautiously, I jumped back into my car and floored it, grabbing my cell phone, trying to call anyone that would answer. And of course, no phone service. I didn't care about the speed limits, cops, or anything else for that matter. After about 20 minutes of reckless driving, I got home. My mother was in the living room as I ran into the house, and she said the most appropriate thing possible when she saw me. You look like you've seen a ghost. I was pale white from head to toe. I sat down on the couch and told her about my little encounter. Like my good mother, she waited till I got home before she went to bed. So a few hours later and no sleep, I went back to my car to check for any damage. And of course, the back seat. Nothing was out of the ordinary. I decided to go to my friend's house, who was also Seminole Indian, and explain what happened early that morning. After hearing the story, she explained that years ago, her great-great-uncle was killed on the road by a group of men who didn't take kindly to Seminoles or black Americans. This happened around the 1940s, and all the police found was a body, but couldn't retrieve the head. She thinks his spirit haunts that particular road, and apparently this wasn't the first time this has happened. Others have had similar encounters while driving on that road. The road is DeSoto Boulevard, North Naples, Florida, near Ave Maria University. It's paved now, and tons of homes are currently built in that area. I've tried to find police records, but in those days in the Deep South, not very many incidents were documented, especially that of natives or black Americans. Like I said, I'm not here to convince anyone. I'm just here to share my experiences. My grandparents moved from Ohio in the late 70s to start a life in Florida. An opportunity to manage a ranch was a dream come true for them. When I was about eight years old, I used to visit them once a month for around two weeks each day. Loved it. The smell of cow manure brings me to a special time in my life, but also brings back horrifying memories. The ranch is located in Florida. I don't want to give the name of the ranch for obvious reasons. Not much history was given to my grandparents before arriving. Shortly after, the owner started to spill the beans. Bound by contract, my grandparents had an obligation to stay for the span of 10 years. The land had some native history, as well as an unfortunate suicide in the front house of the property. An old Navy sailor hung himself several years before. The land has several different ponds and trails which make for awesome adventures. I had lots of fun, till my strange experience. My father and I decided to go fishing at one of the more interesting ponds. At the time, I had no idea what made this pond interesting. Later, when I was an adult, I was told why. The pond was shaped like a donut and had a small mound at the centre of it, around 45 feet from the shore. It was perfectly centred. From the understanding, someone was buried at the centre of this pond. Not sure if this is true. Mostly stories and no real evidence. Anyhow, my father and I began fishing. I got my small bait cast a sized rod and began to hook a worm to my hook. I used a little red and white bobber. I was the type that wanted to fish away from anyone as I thought it would raise my chance of catching something. But that day, something caught me. I cast my line in the water and sat down right at the edge of the water with my feet slightly in the water feeling like a man with my rubber boots, like my old man. After about 20 minutes or so, I noticed my bobber going under and back up, so I decided to set my hook. As I tugged back, 
He felt like something big was on the line. I tugged and reeled, tugged harder and reeled, and my line wouldn't let go. It was stuck on something. At this point, my father was on the other side of the mound and out of my sight. So in big boy fashion, I decided to walk into the water to see if I could tug it in a different direction, possibly freeing my line. I'm about four feet in and the water was just at the edge of my knee-high boots. Not sure if this made sense, but I felt like it was what I was supposed to do. Finally, after tugging my line even harder, it was freed, as if nothing was on it in the first place, and even my worm was still hanging off the hook. Feeling proud, I decided to walk out of the water and recast my line. This is where it gets crazy. So about one foot away from being completely out of the water, my left foot slipped on a rock in the water. I brought my right foot forward to catch my balance, and a smaller stone dug itself into the shin of my left leg. Hurt like hell. As I realised what just happened, I went to pull my left leg forward. I couldn't. I felt my foot pulling back. I struggled trying to pull my leg forward, even spinning around with the bum now in the water. I started to scream, yelling for my father, and it was as if, as if my scream fell on deaf ears. I'm being pulled into the water by something. I didn't feel my hands or anything actually on my foot. Just my leg was not free, and I was gradually going further into the water. I was yelling bloody murder at this point. After about 20 seconds of fighting and yelling, wherever I had my foot, let go. I was soaked and horrified. I ran to my father screaming, bleeding from my left leg and in somewhat of a shock. While yelling, I asked my father, why didn't you come when I was screaming? My father, now shaking because of my reaction, said, son, I didn't hear any screaming. I couldn't see you from this side. I'm calming down a little at this point and I asked him again. His reply was the same. I didn't hear you, son. Needless to say, after showing my father and explaining what happened to me, like most parents would, I just shrugged it off and said my imagination got the best of me. I never fished on the property again. No one believes this actually happened. And trust me, this is something that sounds outlandish. I'm not here to convince, just to share. Has anyone else ever felt something similar? About 15 years ago, a friend and I decided to have a night out at a local club in Fort Myers, Florida. It was around 2.30 a.m. when we decided to leave and head back home. To get home, we had to take State Road 82, about a 45 minute drive from North Fort Myers. If anyone on this thread knows anything about 82, hundreds of deaths have happened on this road, from motorcycle accidents to semi-truck rollovers and everything in between. Extremely dangerous roads with a ton of very strange sightings. Anyway, it was around 3 a.m. when we reached the halfway point home. Windows halfway down, smoking cigarettes and listening to some Pastor Troy. When out of the blue, we heard what sounded like very heavy rain hitting our car. No other cars around and driving about 70 miles an hour. No rain in sight, just a bit foggy. Startled the hell out of us and it lasted for maybe a second, like we drove through a very tiny rainstorm. We looked at each other and sort of shrugged it off and kept driving. If you've ever driven down State Road 82, it's not exactly the safest road to pull over if you don't really have to. So we finally reached home and decided to fill up the car and purchased a couple packs of smokes. I parked next to a pump and my buddy went into the store to pay for the fuel and smokes. When I got out of the car, I decided to just check the car and see if I may have hit something. And honestly, people laugh at me when I tell them this story. But from the middle of the front of my hood, all the way back to the end of the trunk, I saw eight streaks. I was a car guy in those days, and my car was washed and waxed hours before we decided to go clubbing. My buddy came out of the store. I showed him what I discovered, and he was equally puzzled. After I pumped gas, I decided to go over to a self car wash to see if I could get these streaks off the car. Let's just say, I spent damn near 15 bucks and quarters using every setting that car wash had to offer, and the streaks wouldn't come off. 
I said the hell with it and decided to drop my buddy off and head home to bed. The next morning, I decided to have a look at the car. I just couldn't figure out what the hell could have called this. I dropped by my grandmother's house to have breakfast and decided to let her know what happened. My grandmother is an old Latina woman who's very superstitious and knows quite a bit about Santeria. After I told her what happened, she stood up and went to her bedroom. When she came back to the kitchen table, she had white sage, holy water, a rosary and a small piece of silver. I chuckled and asked if she was about to perform an exorcism. She smiled and said, kinda. So I walked outside with her and her items. She surrounded the car with the white sage, inside and out, held her rosary in one hand while whispering something. She put the holy water on a small rag she had in her pocket and proceeded to clean my car. I laughed and told her I'd tried pretty much everything to get those streaks off and nothing worked. And she's now cleaning the streaks off with holy water. My jaw dropped. The streaks were coming off. I was honestly shocked. After she'd cleaned my car, I asked her what she thought it was. And she said that it was a demon trying to latch itself to my car. To this day, I'm still haunted by this and wonder if she was actually right. I tend to have dreams where I feel strongly connected to one of the characters in the dream. All these dreams involve past life events. I recall a dream where I was a small girl in an Indian village. I had the feeling that it was back centuries ago. I had a dream where I was traveling along a river. Suddenly we were ambushed and I was shot in the chest with an arrow. I felt myself rising up quickly and looked down to see the boat getting smaller and smaller. As I rose up, I saw the landscape laid out below me. It was a great plain with forest in all directions as far as I could see. I had the feeling it was Russia, but not sure when. I remember one where I was a man on board a sailing ship, dressed in the style of the 18th century. Another dream was me and a lady friend walking along the southern coast of England, above the white cliffs of Dover. I had the feeling that it was set in the early 19th century. I had a very odd dream a few years ago while I was a soldier making my way through a sewerage system. I was surrounded with bodies floating in the water which came up to my knees. I had no feeling of fear or even revulsion during the dream. It was just a matter of pushing the floating bodies out of the way so I could get through to safety. I think these dreams might all be connected to past lives I've had. That's the only way I can explain that I feel so connected to the individuals in the dreams. I've had a number of other dreams of this type, but that'll do for now. My first post here, but I felt I needed to share, lest I go crazy. I've been a paranormal slash witchery follower for my entire life. It's interesting, and has led to quite a few minor experiences. My mother, who has had many more experiences and has more knowledge than me, always warned me not to mess with things. And until now, I really hadn't. As a short background, I recently moved into my own apartment and have been super stressed due to uni life. Looking for a way to de-stress, I was scrolling through TikTok and found a video about manifesting by putting yourself in a trance-like state and willing a connection. It honestly seemed like a good idea at the time, I did it and nothing happened, but I felt calmer. So I continued for a few weeks, a lot of the time with nothing specific in mind, just putting myself in a trance and reaching out. One time, I felt a sudden sharp pain in my wrist and snapped me out of it immediately. No outside injuries, but it continued to hurt throughout the day. After that, things started getting weird. Phantom pains throughout the day, my plants suddenly began to flourish and then die especially on my sage. Strange noises like hearing my cat, despite him not living with me, or randomly smelling smoke, often coupled with the noises. But weirdest or worst is when I go to bed. As I begin to drift into that place between sleep and wakefulness, I become acutely aware of a feeling of someone sitting at the end of my bed. 
And I swear, I can almost see a silhouette. I'll get a burning feeling in my legs, like something hot is being held against them. Sometimes it's widespread across my whole calf, or it's just smaller pricks around my knees. Once, it even felt like something wrapped around my ankle and pulled along with the sound of laughter. Being alone, this is something that is actually starting to creep me out. But I don't know if I'm just connecting weird separate occurrences. My family would often move due to my dad's job. We lived in around nine different states, sometimes moving houses within them. When I was six, we had moved to Wisconsin and an older Victorian home that we soon found out was once the only house on what used to be a large farm until someone decided to turn it into a small town. In the first year, I had fallen asleep with my mom in the living room. I woke up at about 1am. There was a clock on the opposite wall and the TV was on. And I had seen that about 20 feet away on the bottom of the stairs was a woman. She stood about six feet tall and had long black hair and wore a black and white striped dress that covered her feet. Her face wasn't visible. I panicked but couldn't move. It took about five minutes of squeezing my eyes shut to fall back asleep. I would wake up with small bruises on my arms and legs but thought nothing of it. The same thing happened nearly two years later before we moved. However, I was asleep in my bedroom and I saw her in the hallway, still not moving. I woke up that time with bits of my hair cut around my head. I remember thinking it was my sister until she denied doing so, causing huge upset with the family about her abusing me, which wasn't true at all. Now we had moved to Kansas in a rather nice Tudor style home. Yes, my parents liked older homes. If it was older than 80, yes, we had to live there. I was nearly 11 when I, once again, fell asleep on the couch with my mom. The house was smaller, so the living room was a bit cosier, with a fireplace and stairs on one side, with the den on the other, maybe 10 feet. I opened my eyes and again, she was at the bottom of the stairs, slightly illuminated by the streetlight outside. The next morning, I woke up with a migraine, the only one I'd ever had. It was only me, two of my sisters, and my parents at the time. Then, five years later, we moved to Florida in a rather new home, which was odd for my parents. Just one sister with us this time. Within the first month, she appeared again. I still couldn't move or speak. All I could do was stare. She was in the doorway, maybe six feet away, watching me, wearing that same dress. The next morning, I had cuts on my breasts and neck. After we moved house about four miles away, it was one of the last times I ever saw her until a few weeks ago. She was at the foot of my bed, her face still covered, but I could almost see her breathing. I woke up untouched, but came down with a nasty stomach bug later that day. The last time I saw her, my parents and I just moved back into my childhood home in Michigan. It was my grandparents before they left. I had a room in the basement and was rather happy with the setup. This was until exactly one year after I moved in did I experience her. This time, I refused to open my eyes, tired of being afraid, but I could hear her. She was right next to me, breathing in my ear. She didn't say anything at all, just breathed. The next morning, I was unable to eat due to a nasty sore throat. See, I would assume this was just some sleep paralysis demon or an overactive imagination. However, I still can't shake the feeling that something was or is here. I still get random bruises on my leg. I take iron supplements, otherwise I'm very healthy. And I randomly feel nauseous when I'm alone or just before bed. It's something I've gotten used to, but I always get a creepy feeling on my neck when I'm alone. I still panic when my parents leave and I fill my work and school schedule as much as possible to avoid this. I don't see anything wrong with my surroundings. It only affects me. Starting when I was 19 up until my late twenties, I will be pulled from a deep sleep to find what appeared to be a humanoid standing above me at the side of my bed. 
it was completely black. Think of a void and that's the colour or lack thereof. It's or they were. It happened multiple times over the course of a decade. A lot of times I would jump into fight mode with my heart racing and throw my blanket at it thinking it was an intruder and that the blanket would distract them long enough for me to get the upper hand. But every time I threw the blanket, it would simply flop to the ground. I remember another time I saw it again and scooted back in bed until I was practically sitting on my ex-significant other's head. She was pissed off at that. After each experience, I would lay in bed until I calmed down and then sleep the rest of the night. I've also seen a swirling mass of shadows on my floor one night after waking up, but I chalked that up to my friend telling me about how he experienced that and my brain tricking me. This happened in different dorms, houses, apartments, even states. So I don't know what that was happening. It hasn't happened in quite some time, which I'm thankful for. I also remember my friend from high school who has roots in Southeast Asia, told me that when spirits come to you at night, if they're at your bedside, they're just visiting. But if they're on top of you, it's bad news. Luckily, I've never experienced the latter. I've always been attuned to supernatural stuff, so that's how I explain it to myself. Nine years ago, I lost my lifelong best friend to suicide. The years since have been difficult, but over time, I've made peace with it and have been doing all right. During the first few years following his passing, I had several very vivid dreams of him. While they could very well have been a product of mourning, they always felt more meaningful. I was always left feeling connected and reassured by them. About two weeks ago, I realized that I hadn't had a dream like this in many years. It made me sad, but it seemed to make sense. His passing is no longer the main focus of, of my life. Still, I wondered if he's still out there, somewhere. A week goes by and I don't give the dreams another thought. Then it happened. I dreamt he was back as though he never left. I hugged him and told him how much I have missed him. He said it was great to see me too, but that he's soon going to have to go away again. I begged him not to go, because that meant he would never come back. He told me, you know how to get a hold of me. Call me when you want to talk. I can't just call you, I replied. You won't be in this world anymore. He firmly replied, just call me. You can always call me. I'll answer. And with that, I woke up, both heartbroken and oddly comforted. I felt like I finally got to visit with him again after all these years. Perhaps it was just a dream. To me, it felt like so much more. I worked overnights for over a decade at a shelter for mostly mothers and children, fleeing violence. Throughout my time working there, I would have clients sharing strange experiences. Meanwhile, it was different groups of people throughout the years, and all firmly believed the house held a sort of energy or had apparitions dwelling there. I had a few questionable encounters myself. On two occasions, I literally felt someone standing immediately in my personal space, to the point the hairs on the back of my neck would stand. And when I turned around to say back up, no one would be there. There was one experience in particular that left an indelible mark on my memory. And I'm uncertain if it was a micro dream or a paranormal experience. Being that I worked overnight, between 3 to 5 a.m., if all the folks were asleep and I had done my rounds, I would relax in the office at my desk with the TV on. If I became groggy, I would rest my head on the desk for a few minutes at a time, but would be wake enough that any sounds would jolt me up out of the nap. On this particular shift, it was quiet and all felt safe. I had my head on the desk and immediately began micro dreaming. However, my dream was me sitting at the desk, at work, in the office, and seeing a woman slowly walk down the stairs and past my office door. The ironic part is, in my dream, I knew that this woman wasn't staying at the shelter, and I'd never seen her before. She was an older black woman, dressed in her Sunday best, all pink, 
and her hat was indicative of 1920s or 30s era fashion. I remember in my dream thinking, I don't know her, but I feel safe with her. I won't bother her and will let her be. Then I immediately woke up to the same panoramic view outside of my office door and I just saw in the dream and no one was there. Also, the shelter was an old mansion for very wealthy folk at the beginning of the 20th century. I imagine the apparition I saw or dreamt may have been hired house ship for the family who resided there initially. It became a shelter in the mid 70s. Very odd, I'll never forget this experience. And I'm often left to wonder if spirits are better able to show themselves and communicate through dreams with the living. My earliest memories, roughly four years old. We lived in a very old house in a neighborhood where needles would stick themselves into the sidewalks. Our laundry was in the unfinished basement. To say it was creepy was an understatement. My mama used to make, take me with the family to do the laundry. In fact, I can't ever remember a time she went by herself. She made it into a game with me and would carry me in the laundry basket. She always teased me that if I refused to take a bath, she would just stick me in the washer with all my clothes. There was always a shadow on the wall, though there was nothing blocking it. If you looked at it long enough, you could swear you saw it move. Fear was a new thing to me. I may have lived in a bad neighborhood, but my parents protected me. Honestly, that basement is probably the first time I ever felt uncomfortable and anxious. When we moved out, I remember my mother whispering to grandma that she hopes Shadow Man doesn't follow. She never mentioned it to me as I'm grown now, but I still feel that the basement has a lot to do with why we moved. Sometime during elementary school, my best friend will call her Ash lived in a perfect family. Pastor for a dad, kindergarten school teacher for a mom, a perfect family of six. We were playing hide and seek at her house. We put the bedrooms off limits. We could hide in the garage, family room, living room, kitchen, and two bathrooms. When it was my turn to hide, I went to the top of the stairs and around a small corner and laid down flat next to her bedroom door. It was pretty dark, so I thought she wouldn't see me. As I listened for her to come find me, I turned my face towards the door and looked underneath it. I saw a face looking right back at me. Humans, but very pale with dark sunk eyes. It was centimeters away from my own. I froze in fear and we had a staring contest for what felt like forever. Then it blinked. I went home early that night. Asha's family moved to a new state about a month later. Her family plunged into hell. Her sister became addicted to drugs and tried to commit suicide. Ash herself followed in those footsteps. Her little brother ran away all the time. All of them were hospitalized at some point for trying to OD or shoot themselves. We still talk, but it's never been the same. I moved in with my fiance when we found out I was pregnant, around June 2020. I worked as a baker for a local coffee shop and often worked 4am to 12pm shifts. My fiance worked a lot of 6pm to 2am shifts. I spent a lot of nights alone. I've always been scared of the dark, but this made it worse. September, 3.45am, my apartment was on the second floor. The building was an old farmhouse turned into four small apartments. My fiancé and I were the only ones on the second floor, while two older women occupied downstairs. There was a door to the basement where we did our laundry. Everyone always shut the door, and it was heavy enough that if you didn't prop it open, it would shut anyway. I parked out back, away from the road, so I had to walk past the basement door. The hall lights were off, but I had my phone lights, so I didn't mind. When I walked past the door, I noticed that it was about four inches open. I thought it was weird, but also not my problem. Just as I stepped out the back door, I heard the basement door slam shut. I blame the wind. December, 3.45am. Ring doorbell, 
kept clicking on and off, full charge. Kept showing me videos of an empty hall. It stopped when I grabbed the doorknob. Never did it again. On and off, I noticed small things. Footsteps, soft tapping, things being moved around. Lights that were on when I swore up and down I turned them off. I blamed everything but what I feared. This last experience is the longest. Afterwards, we turned in our 30 day notice. April, sometimes starting in the morning. My son was about a month old. My fiance had gone back to work and I was enjoying my infant cuddles. I laid him swaddled in his crib while he slept and took a well-deserved shower. The bathroom light flickered and went out while I was in there, but the sunlight from the window was enough to continue. I was almost done and I was just rinsing my face when the water got so unbearably hot. I pulled back and when I opened my eyes, my shower curtain was completely open and the water was all the way hot. I started to get scared and got out of the shower. I wrapped myself in a towel and tried to calm down. Almost instantly, my son started screaming bloody murder. I ran to his bedroom and found his swaddle perfectly open. Not like he kicked it open, but laying in a perfect square flat on his bed. As soon as I picked him up, all of the lights in the apartment went out. None of my neighbors had this problem. I was terrified. I quickly got dressed and got my son in his car seat. I went to my mom's till my fiance was off work. We kept hearing the knocking through our 30 days and spent the least amount of time there possible. I still get anxious when I drive past the old place. I just got done eating dinner at my parents' house. It was a typical Sunday. The year was 2013 and I was 22 years old. My parents, sister and my two nieces all left to go shopping, which left just my brother-in-law and me at the house alone. For years, whenever we got the chance to hang out alone, we would play Halo. We were in the last bedroom down the hallway on the left, playing Halo 4 and just enjoying the bro time, when we heard something down the hallway. I guess this would be a good time to tell you that I have an identical twin brother and at this time he was away working in California and we haven't seen him in months. The noise coming from the end of the hallway sounded like a low beating but quickly turned into what sounded like footsteps. We didn't pay much attention thinking it was just my parents or nieces coming down the hallway. Even though I thought to myself it was oddly quick for them to be back. The footsteps were slow, but continued to grow louder. I paused the game, and my brother-in-law looked at me confused as to why I stopped it. I quickly held up my finger to shush him and pointed to the door. We sat there, looking at the door as the footsteps got closer and closer, until they reached the outside of the door of the room we were in, and then they stopped. I was still not scared or shaken by this, since my nieces were young and my dad likes trying to scare us. I still just thought that's what it was. We sat quietly for about 30 seconds and all of a sudden there were three beats against the door. It wasn't extremely loud, but it had an irregular beat to it and it made us both jump a bit. I thought it was weird that they knocked instead of just walking in like they normally do. Still optimistic as ever and still thinking they were trying to scare us, I jumped up smiling thinking, yeah, they got us. As I walked to the door to let them in, but right before I got to the door, a voice said from behind the door, just loud enough for us to hear, Hey, guys. I was taken back because the voice sounded exactly like my twin brothers. I stood frozen, only turning my head to look back at my brother-in-law, who was looking back at me with his jaw on the ground and the same look of shock on his face. He jumps up and runs to get behind me. I grabbed the door and quickly opened it, excited to see my twin brother, who's decided to come home and surprise us. The door swung open and we were hit in the face with a cool breeze and an empty doorway. We looked down the hall, back towards the kitchen. Empty. We call out his name. Dusty, is that you? No response. We scream out for my mom, my dad, my sister and two nieces thinking maybe it was some sick joke but nothing comes back. 
completely freaked out and now thinking somebody has broken into the house. I ran back into the room we were in and grabbed the handgun my dad kept beside the bed. And I tossed my brother-in-law a large machete we always kept in the corner and used for yard work and camping. Now, with both of us armed, I clicked my weapon off to safety and told my brother-in-law, watch my six. And we run through the entire house like SEAL Team 6. We check every nook and cranny yelling, come on, come on out, we know you're there. We didn't find anything. We ran to check the doors and windows. All were locked and nothing was broken. We run outside to see if we can see anything. Nothing. We pull out our phones. I called my brother and he called his wife, my sister. My brother answers the phone. Are you home? I said. No, I'm at work. He responded confused. My brother-in-law yells, they said they're still shopping. We told everybody what happened and everybody acted surprised, but we know none of them believed us even till this day. Now, sometimes when I sit and think of this time in my life, I even start to doubt myself and ask, did that even happen? Was it real? But then I remember I wasn't alone and I call my now ex-brother-in-law and ask him if he still remembers that time. And every time he says, dude, I'll never forget that day.